open the uh, public hearing on House Bill 573 and I recognize the presenters on the slides. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members of the Health, Human, Service, and Elderly Affairs Committee. For the record, my name is Donna Schlafman. I represent Rockingham District 18, the town of Exeter. And I am pleased to be uh, bringing before you House Bill 573 FM to legalize the prescribing of marijuana for medicinal purposes. Um, I want to acknowledge a couple of things. First of all, I want to apologize to you for delivering a 26-page bill and then delivering a 26-page amendment to the bill. It does replace the bill, and I just want to explain how this happened because it sort of informs where we are. Um, for those of you who have been on this committee for the past several years, you have already addressed this subject. You've already ruled in favor, actually, of um, legalizing marijuana for medicinal purposes. The bill that um, I was thought I was bringing forward was uh, from the Honorable Evelyn Merrick, who you will hear from later. She introduced a bill several years ago, House Bill 442, and um, was intending to be reelected. Unfortunately, was not, and would have come forward with another version of um, this bill for you the, this term. And so, when she didn't get reelected, I was very happy to to uh, take her place. However, somebody beat me to the punch and submitted what was told to me was Evelyn's bill. And so I saw <coughs> what I thought was Evelyn's bill, only to find out what they meant by Evelyn's bill was the original House Bill 442, and her intention was not to submit the same bill. So what your amendment does is really bring forward the bill that she would have brought. And the big difference is, and it's an important difference, is that it provides for home growing of medicinal marijuana. 442 is just dealing with um, the what we call the um, alternative care centers, and that is also in this bill. Um, this bill is a nice um, blending of everything we've learned along the way. It um, takes the good parts of uh, Senate Bill 409, which passed both, both the House and the Senate last term, and um, tightens some things up puts it hopefully in a better order. I know this it's a lot of pages, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of reading. There's also a lot of protections in this bill, both for the patients and also um, I, I look at it as protections for law enforcement. So it's very clear um, that this is a medicine. It's very clear what the obligations are for the patients that are receiving it. It's very clear what the obligations are for the alternative treatment centers. Um, I'm not sure we could get any tighter. The thing that I want you to take away from my testimony, and I'm going to be brief because there's so many people behind me, is that we have the advantage of having learned where other states weren't as careful as they needed to be. And so I look at this as a very carefully crafted bill. It's still not quite there, and I hate to say it, but I'm going to leave with you another replacement of the bill, and I don't want you to take this one to heart because there's a couple of other things you will hear from the Department of Health and Human Services that need tweaking as well. What we discovered the other day was a numbering issue, which we fixed in this one. But also, in talking to a nurse practitioner up in the northern regions of the state and looking at the provider definition in the bill you have, we realized that we had just limited it to physicians. And we all know, especially those of us from the rural areas, that a lot of people access their primary care through healthcare centers, and their primary care providers are nurse practitioners or certified, side, regi certified registered nurse anesthetists. And so what um, I've done is, in this one, is included those as people who are primary care. And while I'm on the subject of primary care, I think it's very, very important that everybody appreciate that in New Hampshire, to be um, get a prescription for medicinal marijuana, assuming that we get a law that passes, you will have to have a relationship with your primary care provider that's a three-month, at least a three-month relationship. You will have to have been the guinea pig for many other um, prescription drugs before you get access to this one. So there are, again, a lot of hoops to jump through. You cannot physician shop and just start getting multiple prescriptions, which other, we know, has been a problem with other prescription drugs. You have to have that relationship. You have to be a qualifying patient. And if you look in your 
your law, there is a very strict definition of what qualifies you for this prescription. What diseases or what, what um, physical results of diseases you have to suffer from in order to be a qualifying patient and be eligible for this prescription drug. So I think those things are really important. Um, I know there are a lot of you here that will, will testify, and I want to say to them, I'm not sitting here because I think that it's really important that, that, um, or that I'm advocating that we um, encourage you to participate in drugs. Absolutely not. And again, we're talking about a medicine. And our youth, unfortunately, are already getting the message from our society, better living through drugs. This is not what I'm saying. And I think that if we're really concerned about how youth and drugs are interacting, then we need to look at advertising. We need to look at the messaging. We need to go back many, many years. And I think it's important that we not hold hostage the patients that can benefit from this drug, not hold them hostage, not deny them access, because we have other kinds of drug issues in our society. Um, so you will hear more about um, the effectiveness of this drug, the history of this drug. You will hear from other testimony that this was a legal drug prescribed by physicians decades ago. Think about it. It worked. It was prescribed. It's no longer available. All we want to do is bring it back, put it back in the toolbox of our health care providers so that patients that are suffering debilitating diseases and disease processes no longer have to be breaking the law in order to access their medicine. You will also hear about issues around law enforcement, and I have great sympathy for the terrible position we put law enforcement in by keeping this drug as a Schedule I illegal drug. I think that our federal government has let us down, it's let patients down, and it's let law enforcement down by putting them in a very difficult position. So I think with that, I probably, I'm sure there's much more I can say. I, I had a 14-page little, I'll, I'll walk you through the bill and highlight the things that are important, but I think given how many people want to testify today, I will stop here. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman McKay and members of the Health and Human Services Committee. I'm Senator John Reagan from Senate District 17, the heart of New Hampshire. I was fortunate to be amongst a small dedicated bad weather group that went to Portland, Maine to see how they did things in Maine. And I'm here to tell you that all of the fears about beginning the use of cannabis as medicine uh, are un were proven untrue in the state of Maine. The, uh, the executive director of Half of the dispensaries in Maine said that they received audits from law enforcement for how well controlled their operation is and how there has literally been no problems with, uh, with the use of what they always term as medicine. Uh, Maine allows caregivers to if they're a patient, they can grow cannabis for five other users, so they're allowed to have 36 plants. They're not registered with anyone, and there's been no reported problems for anyone. Uh, people who have had difficulty growing their own <coughs> become customers of the dispensaries because it's apparently a very difficult plant to propagate. So uh, we weren't able to visit the farm, but the, it, we'd done the math and figured it had to be on the order of, of about 36,000 square feet to support the, the production they need to serve their, these four stores that have 2,000 patients now. So 
Uh, amongst the questions that were answered for us, we said, how, how much does this cost people to be uh, patients at a dispensary? And they said that their, that their average sale was about $100. And for that $100, you receive enough medicine to relieve your pain or other symptoms for 15 days. Um, my, I recently lost my wife to cancer, and I can tell you that in the last year, we spent out of pocket about $1,000 a month for the Oxy family of drugs, which had the most horrible side effects, which we don't find when we use a plant. So I'm talking about a plant that grows out of the ground, not a drug manufacturing plant. So they explained to us all the different methods that people use to ingest the marijuana. And um, they have a tremendous educational program, whereas all of the, the employees of the dispensaries have found themselves become counselors. Uh, many people who, for whatever reason, their patients come in more often than they need to fill their, <coughs> their cannabis needs just to talk to the people that work there because they're sympathetic to people with whatever problem they have to have a problem with. So the education component of that is something that we believe will happen with our dispensaries in New Hampshire. Uh, it's, it's not likened to states that had state liquor stores where the employees were not allowed to talk to the customers. If you've ever been there, that's a treat. <laughs> so somebody will take your money, hand you a bottle, and not even say hello. The, uh, I also sit, along with your Chairman McKay, on the Suicide Prevention Council for the state of New Hampshire. And in research for the Suicide Prevention Council, I came across a paper, and the paper discussed the use of cannabis in the reduction of the rate of suicide in the United States. Now, it's hard to gather statistics because we labor under this idea that this is an illegal, horribly dangerous drug. So it's hard to get statistics. But the executive director in Maine what is a transplant from California. And she readily admitted that everything they did in California, they did wrong. So when she came to Maine and was able to help lead them in the creation of their legislation and then their rules, they were able to avoid the pitfalls that we saw, that we, we saw in California. And I believe Colorado also has some terribly problematic issues with, uh, with medical marijuana. Uh, what they found in, this, in the research for suicide was that the use of cannabis reduced anxiety and reduced the need in populations to over-medicate with alcohol. That the cannabis was able to reduce that tremendous drive and that tremendous need for the use of alcohol, and that in itself is a, is a winning proposition. Um, and as I said, the, the data is unclear, but anecdotally, the researchers are confident that this has been the result of the legalization of medical marijuana. So if there's... Uh, and the, the, other, the other thing in regards to law enforcement that was a, an eye-opener for myself was that, um, that they did not find that this inc increased the recreational use of cannabis in, in any population. So in New Hampshire, we have a high rate of tobacco use. So we have the highest tobacco use rate, I believe, in New England. Uh, but there's, there's not a reason to believe that we're going to have an increased marijuana use other than the use that we have already. 
So one of the big questions was how do you deal with the street market for marijuana? And what they related was that um, street dealers readily talk to the folks at the dispensaries. And they said they were glad to see an outlet for people who did not use something that would greatly relieve their pain or their nausea or their agitation. And in my own personal experience, with once again with losing my wife and my mother to cancer, uh, my wife, who was the lobbyist for the New Hampshire Chiefs of Police, would not use cannabis. I offered to go find some someplace, and she said she wouldn't use it because of her her loyalty to her client. And then after 10 years, my sister tells me that we got mom a joint one time, and she smoked the joint, and she said, this is the best I've felt through this whole thing. But then she was hesitant because it was illegal to not use it again. So that's what we're doing by, there are people that already know that they're gonna get relief from this. And we're already condemning them to a high dollar, horrible side effect option for pain control. So this committee has had the wisdom to pass this three times before. So you're coming up for your fourth time to approve this. And we're ready and Senate help to carry it from there. So I would encourage you to uh, find this law to pass. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to take. Any questions? One, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Reagan, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, just, to, just to confirm for myself, you are in support of the amendment over the original bill? Yes. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Do you have a copy of your testimony? Um, Whatever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Seddon Savage. I'm a pain medicine and addiction medicine physician. I've been practicing in New Hampshire for over 30 years. I've served as a past president of the New Hampshire Medical Society and I'm immediate past president of the American Pain Society. I'm testifying today on behalf of the New Hampshire Medical Society in opposition to this bill. These are very complex issues, as we all know, and we are constantly weighing the benefits for individuals against the harms to individuals when we use substances and medications, and we're weighing those benefits and harms for the individual against the potential benefits and harms to the public health. There are thoughtful people on both sides of these issues, and I want to share our perspective on why this bill, as written, is not a good idea. There is absolutely no question that herbal marijuana contains potent pharmacologically active substances that can be helpful in healing, can relieve pain, can relieve nausea, can improve appetite, there's even some emerging evidence that they may be anti-inflammatory, that some of these substances, which are called cannabinoids, can have anti-cancer effects in some settings. Research is ongoing into these medications. There are two marijuana-derived medications currently available in the United States for use. Um, they're approved for medical use by the FDA. There's a third medication um, that is undergoing trials in the United States. It's approved for use in, Can in Canada and in Europe. Uh, 
Um, and that third medication more closely mirrors um, medical uh, mirrors marijuana than the two existing medications. So these all have their role. The National Institutes of Health is is encouraging and promoting research into effective cannabinoid medications, and the pharmaceutical industry is scrambling to find the best combinations of cannabinoids to serve pa patients' needs. All the work that's being done is very promising. Herbal marijuana historically has served a very valuable role in healing before modern medications were available. It was used to relieve suffering in diverse situations from childbirth to traumatic injuries and to terminal illnesses in many, many other settings. Herbal marijuana has been a very beneficent plant to humankind. There's no question about that. But in the context of contemporary health care and pharmaceutical safety standards, herbal marijuana is not a medication. It is not a medicine as we think of contemporary medicines. It's an herb that has all the uncertainties of other herbal remedies. Not unlike St. John's wort that's used for depression sometimes. Um, Foxglove used to be used in the olden days to help people with, with different heart problems. But because of its euphorogenic properties and its propensity to be used, overused, abused, and in fact cause addiction in many people who use it, it's a controlled substance wisely, not unlike its sister plant, or they're not chemically related, but another herb that we use, uh, Papaver somniferum, which is the opium poppy, and we've derived medications from that as well. Drugs which are approved for medical use in the United States undergo extensive safety and efficacy studies. Their production and delivery systems are made uniform and carefully monitored so that we know the doses that people are getting and their freedom from toxic contaminants. After drugs are introduced into clinical practice, we have very careful post-marketing surveillance studies to be sure that the benefits of the drugs that are introduced outweigh the risks and the harms caused by them. Occasionally, there are some challenges with that, but we have a system in place that attempts to make sure that the drugs that patients use to relieve their symptoms are safe and effective. Herbal marijuana meets none of these criteria. Dosing of the active cannabinoids in marijuana is unpredictable due to variable levels, and there are about 60 cannabinoids in marijuana, and they differ from crop to crop. Um, the delivery systems change the way these various cannabinoids are delivered, depending upon whether you're smoking it, eating it, vaporizing it, distilling it. There are a lot of different ways that marijuana is used. And then there are variable patient factors, weight, size, gender, neurobiologic, genetic pathways. Combusted marijuana, smoked marijuana, additionally has lots of hydrocarbons in it, which can cause pulmonary problems. Um, there are numerous carcinogens and otherwise toxic substances. Now, some would argue that because of the anti-carcinogenic effects of cannabinol, that's outweighed. Maybe, but we need further studies to find that out. There is not conclusive evidence regarding those harms. They can, because of the lack of uniform cultivation, they can contain molds, uh, pesticides, and other toxic contaminants. Further, physicians cannot prescribe marijuana. Saying that physicians will prescribe it is impossible. It's not an FDA-approved substance, and we can't prescribe things when we don't know the dosing and effects um, of the particular substance we're prescribing. We need um, drugs that are manufactured with predictable um, effects and side effects. So they can't be prescribed and safely monitored by clinicians or phys uh, physicians and other clinicians because of the unpredictability of the biologic materials. <coughs> Finally, the distribution chain for dispensed marijuana in other states is rarely limited to people for whom other interventions won't work. There, the, the number of patients who respond to good medical care using already approved medications is, is fairly limited, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but marijuana in other states has become widely available to people with a variety of symptoms, both minor and serious. It hasn't been targeted to people who have real unmet medical need. Further, calling medical marijuana 
uh, calling the herb marijuana, medical marijuana or medicine, suggests that marijuana use is safe and that we know the outcomes of its use. In reality, we know that marijuana is associated with some very serious consequences when it's used chronically. Impaired brain development in young people, increased risk for certain psychiatric disorders <coughs> such as schizophrenia, diverse physical and psychological problems that can occur while using it, poor work performance, poor school performance, um, uh, generally impaired performance in a variety of different settings. And despite the common misperception that marijuana is not an addicting drug, it is the second most common drug of abuse for which patients seek addiction treatment across the United States. Now there's a difference between physiologic dependence and addiction. It has both. People develop a withdrawal syndrome when they stop using it, but more importantly, people seek treatment because they have difficulty stopping using it and it has a negative effect on their lives. Not all people become addicted. Not all people who use alcohol develop alcoholism. But there are a significant group of people exposed to this substance who do develop addiction. Um, so rather than advancing herbal marijuana and all the challenges that will accompany it, um, which will further drain our financial resources and administrative and clinical resources when I look at the bill that's been proposed, the challenges to the Department of Health and Human Services are exceptional and demanding. I would really encourage legislators to work to improve the access that our citizens have to quality care for complex chronic conditions such as chronic pain um, and other problems associated that, that herbal marijuana can sometimes relieve. If we believe that herbal marijuana is essential to the care of exceptional patients, if we believe that some patients, and, and there clearly are rare individuals for whom are currently available treatments, may not be effective. Uh, people whose pain, nausea, anxiety, or other symptoms don't respond to approved medications and comprehensive medical care. There are some things that we can do, but I want to say first that some of this is our inability to really get good care for patients. There are many people out there who don't have access to quality <coughs> care, to, to primary care, to comprehensive time with their clinicians. And, and the problem is because they don't have that, their symptom treatment needs are not being, being met. But then there's that subset of patients who really have had good care, who may respond to herbal marijuana. Now, I have to say that most of those patients, in my experience, who feel they need to use marijuana haven't had trials of nabilone or dronabilol, dronabilol, which is the other drug. Sorry for my pronunciation. Anyway, they haven't even had trials of the legally available um, <coughs> cannabinoids. And we're waiting for that third, more balanced drug to come onto the market. But if we believe that we need to make herbal marijuana available to those rare and exceptional patients for whom there are not other answers. Let's number one, frame this as an herbal treatment. It is an herbal treatment, it is not a modern medicine. Secondly, let's craft a marijuana distribution system that really reflects the very limited need for herbal marijuana among patients. And that state and local law enforcement feel they can oversee in a way that prevents diversion. Um, making it available, as this bill does, through distribution through five centers, and possibly that will grow, and growing a canopy of 100 square feet, which <clears throat> is likely enough to um, serve most of the population of Concord for a week or two. Um, we need to make sure that law enforcement looks at this bill and negotiates and believes that they can oversee it so that there's no diversion or not significant diversion. Third, let's focus on really the, the, the way that people are certified to use this drug to assure that there is need, that narrows the indication for the drugs, that includes a requirement for trials of those cannabinoids that are FDA approved. And finally, we need to make sure that we require that all users are counseled on the potential harms <coughs> of use of the drug. As written, 
this bill does not appear to be aimed at making herbal marijuana aver available for the rare patients who truly need it, but more for making an infrastructure to distribute marijuana to many, many people who might feel they feel better using marijuana. And that's a, a lot, lot of people would like to be using um, marijuana, but not specifically needing it for medical reasons. I don't believe it's in the interest of the citizens of New Hampshire to pass legislation which is opposed by leaders in the medical community and in the law enforcement community who are the communities who are going to be tasked with implementation of this bill. So we urge you to engage with healthcare, engage with law enforcement leaders to consider how we might safely meet the, any unmet medical needs of patients that are out there without creating extensive adverse public health consequences for our state. There are many specific incidents, uh, issues with the bill. Um, there, there are two, I think, too numerous to discuss here, but um, we as a medical community would be happy to engage in discussing some of the challenges we think it presents. Thank you very much. Good morning, Dr. Good morning. I'm sure you probably realize there are a lot of people out there who aren't too happy hearing what you have to say. I, I understand that. However, Yes. And it's my understanding that the medications you're talking about that are approved mm -hmm. really don't meet the needs of a lot of the people who are here looking for our help. Mm -hmm. And I gather that you think we need to go through that last process you're talking about before we get into the business of really dealing with the medical marijuana or the herbal marijuana. Well, I think if we make herbal marijuana available um, for people who, whose symptoms are not controlled with, with approved medications and who are getting good care, um, I think it will be for a very short period of time that we would um, need to have that available because I think there are so many um, medications <coughs> in the pipeline that will be available. Um, but I think that it's a mistake to make herbal marijuana widely available, and I believe that this bill will make it widely available. Um, I spent my entire life um, trying to relieve suffering while avoiding untoward consequences, and it's a very, very difficult balance um, to achieve. So, um, but in my experience, with proper medical care, it is really the exceptional patient who needs marijuana, and I think putting that in, in um, balance with um, the effects on the public health, uh, we have to be very, very careful proceeding. And that's why I say I don't rule out the possibility that there is a way to make herbal marijuana, and I do not want to call it medical marijuana, it's not a medicine anymore, we think of medicines, but herbal marijuana available to the rare patient who has no other opportunities. And again, I have to reiterate that I think many of the patients who have found relief only with marijuana have found it because they have not had um, um, access to really extensive and comprehensive pain care or other types of care that could relieve their suffering. Just really asking questions. As a follow-up, mm -hmm. could you tell me, do you, do you believe that uh, people who are here having the issue for the need, they feel the need, are they aware of you, and do they, uh, have you ever seen any of these people? Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know who's here. Um, I, I can't tell you. But there, there, there are many good practitioners in the state. Um, there are limits, as you know, to our health care system and our ability to... Uh, and not everyone has access to it. That's changing. We hope that'll change over the next few These are challenging issues. They're complex. But um, I think it's important to engage the medical community and the law enforcement community and get to a point where we can all agree that this is safe and effective and the best thing to do for, for the citizens of New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Savage, one of the uh, one of the concerns that's out there when people and patients hear opposition from the medical mm -hmm. community mm -hmm. is that people believe the medical community is protecting revenue of doctors and hospitals that might go elsewhere. Uh, how do you address those concerns? Um, that I have not heard that concern. It's an interesting concern. 
Um, the first thing that comes to my mind when we talk about revenue are um, the fact that I think there's a huge amount of profit to be made in the marijuana industry. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that Altria, which is the uh, owner of um, Philip Morris Company, um, one of the large tobacco companies, several years ago um, got the domain name Altria Marijuana dot com Altria Cannabis dot com. So one of my concerns as we expand, and we've seen a number of the states who have had marijuana go on to legalize or, or make marijuana very widely available in different kinds of constructs, is that as that begins to happen, we see marketing of this controlled substances. You know, we've been challenged by those concerns around opioids. Um, and I think everyone who is familiar with the challenges of trying to find the balance using opioid medications <coughs> for pain and preventing public health harm. And that's been a very difficult balance to find. And there is some concern about marketing of those drugs and how that may have contributed to the problem. I see that as a potential um, with a huge industry growing up around promotion of marijuana as well. So it's something to be aware of. Um, now, I, I'm sorry I, I didn't address your question because that's really the first thing that came into my mind. I hadn't heard those concerns. So that the, but there are, as I understand it, in other states, um, clinicians who are opening practices that essentially just certify patients. You know, they go through the um, uh, motions of evaluating a patient and establishing a diagnosis that meets certification for marijuana. Um, so I think there's profit to be made on that side as well. Um, I, I also, I don't, I don't think I made this point very well, that one of my concerns is that because we have limited times with patients, our resources in, in the medical system does not allow us always to provide optimum pain, pain care to patients or care of other symptoms, that what we're doing is taking a substance that makes most people feel better, not everybody, some people don't like marijuana, but many people just feel better when they use it. And instead of trying to really meet the clinical needs that people have in a compassionate and very targeted way, we're saying, we don't have time, our system won't pay for your care. In many cases, we can't get mental health care for patients. They have anxiety, they have post-traumatic stress, they have intrusive memories. We can't get them good care. So instead of working to get a better system, we're handing them a, a herb that we know has some positive qualities, but many negative qualities as well, and saying, go treat yourself. I hope you feel better. And most people will for a while, unless they get <coughs> stuck in that cycle, that downward cycle of distress that's, that's addiction and dependence. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for coming today. Mm -hmm. You talked about positive and negative mm -hmm. uh, connotations of this herb. Mm -hmm. Are there more positive, negative, positive things about the use of marijuana than there are negative things about it, in your view? I, I really can't answer that question. I think it depends upon, I can't answer it for all individuals. I think it, it, it depends upon the individual. I think, you know, occasional use of marijuana um, by responsible people who don't have the disease of addiction um, may, may uh, it's illegal, but is that harmful? Um, I think many people have had the experience that for, for themselves, it's, it's not harmful. Is chronic daily use um, a benign um, uh, thing? No, it's not benign. And in fact, you know, one of the things that I think law enforcement will likely talk about, I don't know, is the fact that it's a very impairing substance when people use it, as alcohol is. We can't drive, we can't use machinery and the influence of it. But it's a much longer acting drug, so while the high may last for only uh, three to eight hours, depending upon the strength of the marijuana, the euphorogenic effects may only last for a short period of time. Some of the fine motor, the judgment, and the perceptual impairments that people have, the, the time impairments, the, the spatial perceptual impairments, last much, much longer than that. And so, we, it's not a, do the, it's individualized. What is the setting, what is the, um, in, who is the individual? What's the 
the herb that they're using because the herbs are so different in terms of their potency and the balance of cannabidiol and THC and all the other 58 cannabinoids in them. So I, I can't answer your question. Thank you. Can I ask that? <coughs> oh. One question, please. Yes, sir. Does, I'm considering, thinking about public spaces, you know, nursing homes, uh, elder housing, nursing homes, mm -hmm. but any public thing, they, a lot of times you'll see a sign, no smoking. This being, if it was, went forward as a medical thing, would that, would they be forced to allow the person to take what, this so-called medicine? Um, I, that would depend upon how the bill is constructed, I believe, and um, I think that was addressed in the bill. I only got the final copy of the bill last night around 10 o'clock, and it's 24 pages, so I can't answer your question. Um, the representative most likely could. But if it was, if hypothetically it were, then, if it was something, it is allowed, it doesn't, say it doesn't mention, would, if this was a medicine, considered a medicine, would that then trump a policy at a particular place that does not allow smoking because it's a medicine? Well, it, it cannot be viewed as a medicine under federal law because it's not an FDA-approved substance. So I can't answer the question because that can't right, happen. Thank you. thank you. I'm sorry, I don't mean to no, no, avoid the question. You. I just can't answer it. It's not a medicine. It's an herb. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, John Williams out there, sometimes I can't see you. John Williams and uh, Michael Hart. Department of Health and Human Services. Chairman McKay and uh, August members of the Health and Human Services. Uh, and, and Elderly Affairs Committee. I'm John Williams, I'm an attorney with the Department of Health and Human Services, and I'm the legislative uh, director. Uh, with me today is Mike Holt, who is our administrative head of our rules unit. Um, and we're here basically uh, not to be a position on the legislation, but to be here as a resource to this committee and also to the fine sponsor, Representative Bachman, and also co sponsors such as. Um, um, Senator Reagan, uh, who testified <coughs> previously. Um, of note, we have been here uh, on at least three different iterations of the bill, and we've maintained a neutral position, recognizing the value <coughs> of all the stakeholders, uh, from the individuals you'll hear about their personal experiences, as well as uh, the um, uh, individuals like Dr. Savage, who is, is uh, very much respected and revered by the agency. Our purpose here today is to, again, provide information regarding the fiscal impact. And if you go to the very last page of this, you'll see set forth a very concise uh, fiscal impact uh, statement from the department. And what most importantly of interest to the department is the funding for implementation of this particular program. And as you'll see in the first part of the department's analysis that we anticipate that revenues will be generated by the application fees, fines, and private donations uh, however, we, we don't expect until state fiscal year 14 uh, for the revenues to be available. I don't see any fiscal note on the documents that we have. Well, Chairman McKay, I must say, this is one of those unusual circumstances in terms of document control. I actually grabbed it from the stack over here, and it did have on my version a copy of the fiscal note uh, worksheet. Or fiscal note. Anybody else have a question? Yes. Look, look beyond page 25. It's on the original. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> commentary to certain technical changes that we'd like to see had to the bill. 
Uh, but, but essentially, if you read through the bulletin statements there, it goes through the enumerated list of things that we would have to do as an agency to get this program up and running. And uh, there are some timing issues that we certainly will be addressing with the sponsor in this committee relative to the date and time for the effective date for implementation, as well as the rulemaking authority and um, other issues. And fortunately, I have with me Mike Holt, and my promise to the committee to keep my commentary limited to five minutes or less, I, I always bring my experts with me. And Mike has prepared a very brief list of kind of part of the concerns that we have that we'd like to relate to the committee. And again, if this goes to either a subcommittee or if it doesn't we'll work directly with the bill sponsor, uh, we'll, we'll uh, need to work through some of the issues that the department has. So with that said, I'd like to, Chairman McKay to turn it over to uh, Michael Holt. Uh, good morning. Um, some of the issues that we've identified in the bill that we would uh, like to be looked at or um, corrected include uh, mainly clarity issues. Um, one issue is regarding the criminal records check and who is responsible for paying for that is not made, made explicit in the bill. Um, consent and social security numbers, perhaps, what might be required. Um, as you know, uh, RSA 541A, the rulemaking authority requires specific authority to require social security numbers. There's no mention of that in the uh, um, in the bill. Um, further, um, there's incomplete fee authority granted to the department relative to assessing um, fees to agents. Um, fee authority is specific authority is required in order for us to set a fee. Um, we'd like an addition of RSA 541A plugged in in various places. Um, there's inconsistent language regarding how the fees are supposed to cover all of our administrative costs raised twice in the bill using different language, suggesting different uh, different models. Um, there's um, There are other uh, issues, minor ones. There's one instance of dispensary um, as opposed to alternative treatment center. Uh, there's one instance of terminate regard instead of using the word revoke. So these are all some uh, technical issues that we'd like to work with uh, you to, uh, to solve. Any questions? Okay, thank you. And we really appreciate the, the intent of the stakeholders working together on this uh, issue that's one about compassion and compassion treatment of patients uh, who are suffering from fertility diseases. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for the record, my name is Tim Rourke. Um, I've been before this committee before. I'm the chair of the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse. Um, I would, however, ask your indulgence this morning um, <clears throat> in allowing me to testify as an individual. Um, although before I do noting that the commission is releasing its five-year state plan tomorrow. So if you're in the building at around 1130 and want to come into the LOB lobby, we'd welcome to have you there for our substance use strategy release. Um, I want to speak as an individual for a couple of reasons. First off, the Governor's Commission has not had a formal meeting since, December, uh, since October, and so the Commission has not had an opportunity to discuss this particular bill and weigh in on a Commission-wide response to it, um, which I hope to do tomorrow. We'll certainly submit that, uh, that response in writing to the extent that it's helpful. Um, I actually want to speak to uh, having been in the substance abuse prevention field for approximately 20 years. Um, I am speaking in opposition to this bill, um, but I speak to it more so as the parent of a cancer patient. Um, my son was diagnosed with a brain tumor called an atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor of the spine, CNS, um, in 2006. Um, he received about uh, a year and a half of incredibly high dose chemotherapy and radiation. Um, and as I understand from the medical team that worked with him, comparative to the chemotherapy regimens that most adults face, um, it really paled in comparison. Uh, my son is one of the only survivors in the world of this particular diagnosis. He will turn eight on Sunday and currently has no evidence of disease. I share this with you, however, because I have seen incredible pain and suffering um, caused by cancer. A cancer treatment that was so brutal that, to Dr. Savage's point, very, very often existing methods of treatment to ease his suffering were not effective. My son spent a significant amount of his tenure underweight um, he had a tube implanted in his stomach because of his loss of appetite. He developed a condition called mucositis, which many cancer patients are familiar with, where your immune system drops so low and the cells in your, the lining of your digestive tract begin to wither and die that you develop mouth sores that are incredibly painful. 
making it painful to swallow and to eat. However, um, in that instance, particularly when my son was most um, struggling with his pain, he was not sent to a specialized opium den that was regulated by the state. He was provided morphine, a derivative of the poppy plant that is used and approved by the FDA to relieve pain and suffering in that instance. And for my son, it worked. He had that medication supervised by a team of approximately five doctors, his oncologist, a pain management specialist, his neurologist, the radiologist who was providing him radiation therapy, um, closely, closely monitored his use of that morphine. Now, I will also emphasize that my son was 15 months old when he was diagnosed. Um, I do not see in this bill any, no, any idea that this medication would necessarily be, if it were to be passed, provided for pediatric use. Um, however, my son is very likely to relapse uh, because of the nature of his condition and the way he was treated. So I am incredibly interested in treatment methodologies and improvement of relief of symptoms for cancer patients, both youth and adults. I believe, as Dr. Savage does, that there are medicinal benefits to the marijuana plant, much like there are to the poppy plant. However, if we're going to treat it as medicine, let's do it. It is not the job of the state to circumnavigate the Food and Drug Administration. There are medications currently available that are cannabinoid-based. The drug that, she, that Dr. Savage referred to called Sativex is in phase two clinical trials, which means it is available right now to patients at the most highest of needs. Now, I will agree that the FDA does not work really robustly and really as aggressively as it should when it comes to medication approvals and releasing those medications into the community. We've had a history of fights in various disease cohorts to push and promote the FDA to make faster responses to put drugs on the street. I've spoken to that very much in my own work personally, again, as a parent of a cancer patient, advocating about the need for faster research and release of FDA-approved chemotherapy agents. Um, they're not as uh, damaging as the agents that my son was exposed to. But my point is that if this is a medicine, we should be looking to advocate and engage in dialogue with the institutions and infrastructures in this country that ensure patient safety. It is not state stepping in and approving a medication for use, a medication that, as Dr. Savage noted, she wouldn't even legally be allowed to prescribe, even in the instances where she does have a patient for whom no other existing medication works. The conversation around the medicinal value of marijuana and its components should be had with the Food and Drug Administration. For states to supersede that does more harm than good. The second piece I want to note is the issue, and I want to recognize um, the sponsor of the bill who testified in her important message, obviously, that this dialogue should not include at all any notion that marijuana use is safe for young people, which is true, and a very welcome comment. However, states that have approved marijuana of any kind, be it for medicinal value or for other recreational purposes, have seen a spike in youth use of marijuana. There are two reasons for that. Oftentimes we talk about access. Well, in a highly regulated environment, access isn't quite an issue. Um, and certainly the bill proposed to date seeks to provide as many controls as possible to prevent diversion. However, the other thing that drives use among young people is the perception of risk. If young people do not perceive that a particular substance is risky or a particular behavior would have negative consequence, they are more likely to engage in that behavior. In the state of New Hampshire, we conduct the Youth Risk Behavior Survey. It's done every two years. It's, been, it's administered by the Centers for Disease Control. About 80 to 90 percent of our high school students in the state take it. The last one was done in 2011, and the next one is currently being administered as we speak. In the 2011 data, and we've been trending this data since the, since the early 90s, in the state of New Hampshire, the perception of risk around, around marijuana is dropping, which means that young people do not perceive that marijuana is harmful. That is partially driven by a robust dialogue around questioning, is marijuana medicine or is it not? Now, that is not at all to default this discussion, because I think this is an important discussion to have. But I want to be very, very clear that any idea that marijuana use will not rise among young people if you pass this bill is fundamentally inaccurate. Because the ca all the caveats in the world don't change the fact that if we approve a smoked marijuana and call it medicine, young people will not see harm to it. Um, so again, I'm in opposition to the bill. It will be my recommendation to the Governor's Commission in my role as chair um, that we oppose this bill. But I really felt the need to speak to you as someone who also very much sympathizes with people who suffer, um, who suffer incredible pain, because I've seen pain you can't even imagine. 
um, in someone I love very deeply, and there was very little I could do to stop it. Um, but I believe that when if that ever happens to my son again, I don't want to have to bring him to some ancillary shop somewhere else in the state, being delivered a medication with someone who has absolutely no training in how that medication cross-references with the 37 other drugs he was on at the time, not being able to be supervised in a clinical environment by his physician, I want him supervised at the Dana-Farber where he got treatment under the care of the pharmacist at the, at the drugstore that knows the comprehensive array of medications he was on. I don't think a specialized dispensary for marijuana so, offers a lot of patient dignity if I have to send my son somewhere else. So that I'll, I'll take questions. And again, thank you for the indulgence of seeing me as an individual today. Okay. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Representative Rose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable committee members. I'm uh, here as uh, Representative Bright. I'm from Carroll County District 8. I'm from Tuckenborough. And I'm here to, um, to talk about this because it involves uh, my wife, who has stage 4 metastatic breast cancer. She's had it for, well, it's been stage 4 for 19 years. Um, several years ago, uh, Things changed in her prognosis somewhat in that um, the cancer spread from the lymph nodes in her arm to the rest of her body. It's in the bones of her pelvis, her hips, and her back. And uh, being at Dana-Farber, we were able to get her into uh, a phase one clinical trial that was just coming available, and um, <clears throat> which worked quite well. The, uh, her response was absolutely fantastic to the trial. It really, uh, it really changed our, our perspective on the whole subject. Um, about a year into the trial, she started to lose weight dramatically. Uh, 32, when she hit 32 pounds, they said, look, you've got to stop losing weight uh, or we'll have to take you off the trial. There's no sense of being on the trial. It's killing you. She tried everything that they had available. Uh, there's a list of stuff that I could go through, and none of it worked. Um, she's constantly nauseated, and another lovely side effect is that she spontaneously vomits anything that's in her stomach. So her trying to keep the trial drugs down became a real issue. She'd have to hold on to it to try to get the benefit from those drugs. And after several, I would say, months at this point, um, and we became very desperate that she was going to be removed from this trial at, at this point, it was really saving her life. Uh, it, was a, it was a charge nurse at Dana-Farber that said, you know, a lot of the patients in here are dealing with this issue by smoking marijuana. So she tried it and immediately responded to it. And um, that's really what's brought me here today. It's now four years she's been on the trial, and she continues to, to, to do well. She can now eat. She has a very minimal amount that she needs to use of the marijuana to keep, just so that she can eat. Um, <clears throat> the thing that really has occurred to me, I, was, I too was one of the uh, members of the group that went to Portland in the snowstorm. And the thing that hit me the most was uh, the amount of money that's involved in having to go there. Based on my calculations and their pricing, it would cost us about $400 a month. Now, we've been involved in cancer treatment for 20 years. And, you know, the financial end of this is just devastating. It can be. And to add on another $400 a month to our medical bills would be, um, it, would, it would just be almost impossible for us to keep up with. So what's really important for me and for those <coughs> patients like my wife and ourselves is to be able to have that grow option. Uh, it's really important to understand that um, 
someone in our position is not about to try to divert <coughs> this, I hesitate to call it a drug just for the same reasons that we discussed that we've had before. But, you know, you, we, we stand to lose the ability to have this available for my wife if we do divert it. And um, not to mention the two, there's already a felony, so if you sell it, you're going to be charged with a felony. And this bill allows law enforcement to add another misdemeanor on top of that. Um, I'm going to keep it brief, so I'm going to make myself available to this committee for the future. So if you put a subcommittee together, I'll be there whenever you need. I, I can go a lot more into this topic, but for the sake of everybody else, I'll leave it at that. So I'll be glad to answer any questions. One question. Um, if you so much. And I just wonder if you would feel more comfortable either growing your own or uh, purchasing from a dispensary than you would from getting it from other sources. Comfortable in the quality of what you receive. Well, absolutely. I, I think uh, it, I, I, my background, I was in the Coast Guard when I was in my early 20s. And so I've seen the other side of the story. I've been involved in, in large drug busts. And so it was a problem for me to really have to take that step and, and give good, hard-earned money to somebody I view as a criminal. Uh, so us to be able to do our own thing and make sure that the quality is there and that there's no mold in it is really important. And either at home or at a dispensary. The problem with a dispensary is the cost. It really is. There's no, there's no way to um, to offset that. The insurance companies won't pay for it, and rightfully so. They, it's not a, a legal drug. So. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Richard Conte. <coughs> Good morning. C R A T E. Thank you. <laughs> I'm also thinking yeah. about Marjorie <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. My name is Richard Crate, and I'm the Chief of Police in Enfield. I appear here today on behalf of the New Hampshire Association of Chiefs of Police in opposition to House Bill 573. We feel that our medical system relies on proven scientific research, and questions of medicine are for the FDA and our doctors to answer. They have a system in place to ensure standardized composition purity, potency, effectiveness of our medications. More research is needed, as you've already heard. We have to rely on the experts in the medical field. I do have some handouts um, from two doctors, Dr. Kleber and Dr. Romero Sandoval, um, for your reference. As you've already heard, the FDA has approved two forms of cannabinoid-based medicine in the form of a pill, Marinol and, forgive me on the pronunciation, but Kazin, I think is how it's called. These can be controlled for their strengths and do not deliver the harmful side effects of smoking marijuana. Smoking marijuana is problematic because of the potential carcinogenic toxins and the difficulty of ensuring delivery of the same dose. <coughs> there are significant law enforcement concerns that weigh heavily against this passage. We are concerned that referring to marijuana as medicine has already created the misconception that marijuana is not a dangerous drug. It is an addictive drug that poses a significant health dangers to its users. We will encounter significant problems. It will be very difficult for us to distinguish the recreational marijuana user and the medical user. The potential for redistribution is very real. 
to legalize marijuana, even for these limited purposes, will result in diversion for illegal purposes. We've already seen several cases up in New Hampshire, and even in my community, where diversion of medical marijuana from another state was shipped to New Hampshire for recreational use. The use of marijuana by teenagers is on the increase, and again, sends a false message misleading to the residents, and our children in particular, that marijuana is not harmful. This message is in direct conflict with the drug ed education programs taught throughout our state to our children. We work diligently to discourage our youths from making poor choices. Even if limited legalization has safety concerns for the driving public, marijuana affects many skills required for safe driving, including coordination, alertness, reaction time, and the ability to concentrate. Finally, House Bill 573 would make it legal under the Hampshire law for compassion <coughs> centers to cultivate and dispense marijuana. It remains a crime under federal law. So when somebody says to you that, that they want to be able to use this without committing a crime, <coughs> if you legalize medical marijuana, pass this bill and it becomes law, they're still committing a crime under federal law. We should not condone the violation of federal law, nor should we encourage our citizens to put themselves in a position of being subject to federal prosecution. The New Hampshire Associated Chiefs of Police opposes this legislation for the reasons I've noted above. I don't take any uh, any questions yet. Any questions? It is. Okay, so whether or not a person was on um, legally prescribed marijuana, it would still be illegal for them to drive under the influence? That's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chief, for being here. You're almost a neighbor. Um, I'm just wondering if there's anything that can be done to this bill um, in any manner, shape, or form to move the chiefs to the point where you might feel like you could ever support it? Um, what I have been testifying in opposition to this for many years, um, I've been asked that question a number of different times. Um, I think Dr. Savage uh, raised some, some good issues that um, I think we need to have a little more of a discussion. What I've testified to before and what my concerns have been is that it's just kind of a blanket um, you know, use that, that we're just sending this out and saying, go ahead and try it, and um, it works. So I think that, that she's laid out some things that um, I'd have to go back to our association and we'd have to discuss it as a membership um, to look at. But um, if the FDA came out tomorrow and said, this is how it's going to be done, then we wouldn't be here today. Obviously, we wouldn't be you know, down there opposing it um, like we are now. And we're looking at, at the experts and you know, those handouts. Um, I attended a symposium at Dartmouth College. And quite honestly, um, over the last several years, I've gone to a number of different college forums. And so I was kind of expecting you know, it to be one-sided, not on my you know, side of things. And, and I was quite surprised to listen to the researchers or the physicians up there, you know, talk about all the other things that that we I've been talking about in some respects, but not um, just didn't have. You know, I'm not a physician, so I didn't have the medical research behind me uh, to look at that. I've also spoken to. You know, there's a misconception that the FDA, you know, is they're regulatory. You know, a company comes to them and says. This is what we have for medication. We want to try to get it out there. We need approval to do that. There are some, you know, some things that are happening, but it's not like the FDA is going to go and do their own research and say, yeah, you can go and use this. That's not how it works. So there's that misconception as well. The other thing that cannot be ignored is that some of the same people that you'll hear today, you know, we were at a hearing last week to legalize and decriminalize marijuana. Their mission is to legalize marijuana and you know to they're against prohibition of the marijuana similar to alcohol 
So there are some of those, um, some of the re reasons for this bill uh, and in passing this is their plan, similar to what happened with alcohol. Um, I went online and looked and found where you could get a prescription back in prohibition for alcohol from your doctor. It's literally, you know, a prescription. Um, I think it was two shots or something like that was what I Googled uh, online because obviously I wasn't there then. Um, I need to understand a little bit better about the um, enforcement. So I'm wondering, um, when you stop a driver, um, you check to see if they have a license. And if you came across someone who said they were using medical marijuana, they would have a card that would say, yes, I have a uh, right to do this. So, would there be any um, problem with that? Would that make it unclear? Is there anything in the language that could be improved so that it was very clear to you who could and who could not possess that marijuana? Well, I think you know they in the legislation uh, in the bill it does have you know, the card, and and what I'm concerned with 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 the driving is that people would use. As Dr. Savage you know, testified to, I think the use and the effects would could be longer than you know, for, and longer in different people. Similar to you know, to any other drug or alcohol or those type of things. So we have to look at the same thing. Um, we have a member of the. I'm not sure if he's going to be testifying, but there's a member of our uh, state lab here who can address the you know, testing. Of it. What we would look for is, is this person impaired? And whether they're impaired by um, medication that they're on right now, or alcohol, or marijuana, we would you know, look at that and you know, do that. What, again, I'm concerned is that we have more people that may be out on the road driving to be influenced. Thank you. I, I use the for example, I think, because I wasn't concerned in this case with, in this question with driving while impaired. I was just concerned with possession and being able to distinguish between people who are allowed to possess marijuana and people who are not allowed to possess marijuana. So is the card that is outlined in the bill sufficient to make it clear to an officer who is and who isn't? Allowed? I think there's, you know, because Again, you're trying to, we're trying to be protective of people's medical rights. So, like, we'll, we'll get that. so there's, there's some discussions in, in last year when um, I was meeting with Representative Merritt and um, Senator Forsythe. That was that balance. How do we protect people's confidentiality like we do with medical records and, and those type of things with, you know, this? So there's definitely some, you know, some gray area in there that, that would need to be, I think, cleared up to make it easier for us. Yes, yes, but Chief, thanks for being here. Uh, just to, to continue on this issue here, and knowing that there's other criteria you are addressing, we'll, um, we'll stipulate for the fact that you'd have to address the impairment issue if you pull someone over. However, when, uh, what I wrote down here was the initial concern for first responder, or in this case, I mean, a, a police officer pulling someone over would be, is this a recreational user or a medical user? And if the card was there, but de facto, the HIPAA standard would be met because they're saying, I'm giving you my personal information, here's my card. Yeah. If that was specific to one of your criteria that you correctly pointed out, would that meet that test on who is a user recreationally versus a medical required user? Well, I didn't see the, the amended version of the bill. But I'm oh, then in that case, there. Chief, then to save but time, you have, bill, to, have you read the bill? Yes. But what have I you read the amended bill? Not the amended bill. Then, then, then I'm going to hold off because it's unfair to you unless you read that amended bill. But what, right? I, what I think is, and I doubt it would be in there, is that either way, whether that person is a recreational user yeah. or they have a car, they can't be driving here. And I, I can't believe they can take that out of the amended version. Uh, a follow-up, Mr. Jim? Uh, I'm with you 100% chief on that. Uh, that's why I said I'll stipulate to the fact that if the impairment, that's, that's, that's in the other room. 
it, the room that we're in is medical use of marijuana, but putting the, our men and women in a tough situation is, is this a rec user or not? Your criteria, would, you, would your criteria be a card on the possession that says, yes, you can, they may have it in the car? Well, I think that identifies those, you know, those users or not. Yeah. Um, they'd have to have that card. You know, we're dealing with, with this, on the books right now, the law is that um, if you don't have your medication in the actual container, that's a violation, that's a right. crime. Yeah. So it tells us, you know, that, that if I have five pain pills, they're in the box, this is what they are. You know, I think the safety thing, so if something happens, I can tell, I think the number of them this way. But we're able to say, yep, Dick Crate has, you know, these five pills, it was prescribed by this doctor, instead of it just being in the bag. And what we're seeing, the diversion of, of pain pills, pain pills, we're dealing with that a lot. With the marijuana, you know, if we pull somebody over and they've got marijuana, it doesn't have that same prescription type of thing. We have to look and, and it says they have to have that card with them, I think, uh, in the bill. So, but human behavior, we all forget things. Um, you know, some skis were left in school for a week outside. So, in these days, we forgot. Your son did what? Left his skis outside. You forget things. So, people are going to forget their card at home. You know, we pull people over, they don't have their driver's license with them. They're uh, supposed to have that. There's a law saying they have it. We forget things. Um, we all do. So we find somebody, you know, we arrest them, we process them, and then we find out they've got the car, they go to court, you know, do we prosecute them, or do we, do we let them go, because you know, they're a patient? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to uh, defer to the Representative Colbert. I think he wanted to say something first. How do you know the driver is driving impaired? How do we know? Yeah. Well, in some cases, they they hit things, they drive all over the road. When we walk up to them, um, we can smell the alcohol. They appear intoxicated, or you know, their behavior is such that that it's not normal. How do they use the marijuana? Um, same type of things that what we look for is is what their coordination is, how they're talking. You know, we had a we had a gentleman the other day that was smoking while he was driving down the road. One mass is arrested on Monday morning. That's obvious, but if you don't have the smell, whoop, I'll just go through the chair. If you don't have the smell and you can't uh, provide a sobriety test. What we're doing right now, uh, there's this kind of two, two things. We have uh, drug recognition experts, police officers trained to detect, you know, if somebody's at any point of drugs. It's a little different than the alcohol. Um, that's an extensive training program that they go through. So we do have some officers that are trained in that. But what we're looking at is just, you know, people's coordination and their behavior when we walk up to the car. Um, if somebody appears to be, you know, intoxicated or high, then the officers will take them out of the car. Um, they'll run the Garcia and field sobriety tests on them. And if they don't pass those, then we'll arrest them and request a blood test. Um, so we are seeing some of those things. We just have the law that deals with, you know, drug driving um, that opened it up a little bit more. We are seeing a lot of that now. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. If I were a card carrier and authorized to use for medicinal purposes, and looking down the road I were pulled over because I was under the influence, would I be absolved of whatever harm I might be doing to someone or have done to someone? I don't believe so, no. Thank you. Thank you for testifying. Uh, I have a question, to, and you may not be able to answer this, but you're probably the most qualified. How have other states dealt with uh, state federal jurisdiction issues? For example, Colorado. Uh, I think that's still being debated you know, between the states and the feds. Um, that's, that's just what I've read in the, in the newspapers and, and seen, you know, through the different, uh, some of the different fields of, you know, what is the federal government going to do? I do know that, that they're cracking down. Um, there have been some cases where 
somebody's tried to use the uh, state law to, <coughs> to uh, protect them from the federal prosecution and the courts have said that that's not a protection.
destroying what little bit of light I have. Marijuana allows it, me to take less of the opiate pills. And I've done so for many years. I can't remember exactly when I started. All I know is at some point, the oxycontins that I would prescribe started making me very sick. And talking with my doctor, he suggested that it was an alternative route that I could try on my own if I felt safe in doing so. And as a side effect, I started to gain weight. is the difference between another year here. Uh, I could answer almost every single question that any of you might have. I've gone through it all and met so many patients that if I haven't gone through it personally, I've heard of it. I, I just really need to stress that this needs, this bill is so much tighter than the previous ones that for it to come this far and to fail would be nothing short of a joke. There are many patients 
Um, many patients who benefit from herbal marijuana, you know it, they can't wait until clinical trials and the onerous burden of trying to prove one way or another and to get this through the FDA. They can't wait. They need it now. And it's been proven. And you can't tell these people that they're just an exception. There's, there's too many of them. Uh, I also want to thank Representative Fox and Bobby Bennett for including me in her introduction. <laughs> And to the representative from the Governor's Commission, um, my heart goes out to you. Uh, I am a cancer patient. I wasn't going to bring this up. But the fact of the matter is that in my case and in many other people's cases, the only, only alternative that helped me, that mitigated my pain and suffering in, when I was in the depths of the deepest hole, was herbal marijuana. And that being said, <laughs> Today begins what so many of us hope will be the final chapter in creating a law to give safe legal access to an alternative treatment for disease-stricken patients. Herbal marijuana has been proven to bring comfort and pain relief and minimize suffering for so many of our sickest and terminally ill patients. Now, many of you sitting here in front of me have been part of this journey. You have watched and even participated in the evolution of what began over, actually over six years ago, as, um, as a weaker bill, but nevertheless the beginning. The legislation you have before you, HB 753, excuse me, 573, as amended, is the result of years of trial and error. It continues to evolve into an extraordinarily precise, clear, and tight bill. It's a bill this committee, this legislature, and this state can take pride in. HB 573 is more thoroughly written and vetted than ever before, and I, will be, and I believe will prove to be the model legislation for this country when it comes to providing access to medical herbal <laughs> marijuana, which is a most important and should be a most important option to the health care regimen of those patients in need. From my experience and my involvement with the collaborative effort for over six years and being a champion and co-author of the ongoing work to create this legislation, I most emphatically believe that HB 573 is finally exactly what the doctor ordered. Representative Schlockman and her teams continue to work with all of the stakeholders to remove ambiguity and craft a benchmark piece of legislation that ensures clarity and control. I do acknowledge that there are potential risks with the use of cannabis, but so it is true with every legalized drug, medicine, OTC remedy, and practically every other alternative therapy that exists. I cannot stress enough the controlled use of cannabis provides clear and unquestionable relief for many patients without the sometimes horrific side effects of accepted pharmaceuticals and even OTCs, which we know have been proven to cause death. And this was just on the news. I don't know if any of you heard the news a couple of days ago, the increased use of overdoses and deaths in the oxycontin and oxycodone drugs. Um, the, this bill provides great oversight for the Department of Health and Human Services, clear and precise limitations, and protection of the law for anyone who is qualified and is a registered patient. Our government does not provide the same control for many more legal <coughs> substances. Passing HB 573 and doing all you can to make sure that this legislation becomes law is critical to improving the lives of so many people in this world. We owe it to those people sitting and standing in this room, to every patient who is suffering, dying, or confined to a life of PTSD without relief, and who cannot find relief from any other legitimate 
legal source. We owe it to every citizen of the state who year after year have come to this room, people like Clayton and so many other people behind us. This building, this body of government which represents the willingness, the commitment, and the desire to act in the very best interest of its citizens. I ask you please, do as you've done before, support this bill. It is long overdue. We want Clayton back. And I thank you and I apologize for my <laughs> A little emotional setback, and I'll be happy to do it. We might all need those tissues. Any questions? Thank you, everyone. Oh, quick question. Yeah, it's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Um, can you just review which states have got uh, medical marijuana laws in place in New England? I know Maine and Vermont. Maine, Vermont, Rhode Island. Uh, Massachusetts now has, they have deep trim, and I do believe they now also have a medical marijuana bill uh, pending. Uh, connected both into New Jersey and so forth. So we are surrounded. Thank you. Assistant Attorney General Elizabeth, is it? I think what is it? Woodlock? Woodcock, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Woodcock. I'm an assistant attorney general. It will probably come as no surprise to this committee that the attorney general opposes this bill. Um, I wanted to take, I'm, I'm obviously not a medical doctor. And uh, there are people in this room who are engaged uh, more on a uh, daily basis with enforcing the state of New Hampshire's drug laws than I am. Um, but I, I wanted to take a moment and talk about the bill. I will add a caveat. I don't have the amended copy. I do have uh, some written testimony, and it refers to the <coughs> bill as introduced. And so perhaps some of the page numbers and there may be some things that have been changed in the bill that I'm unaware of. Uh, but I wanted just to take a few minutes and, and talk about the bill and talk about law enforcement generally. Uh, I don't need to reiterate what you've already heard, that New Hampshire does have an addiction problem. And uh, it's a problem that concerns law enforcement, the Attorney General's office, and the people who are out on a daily basis enforcing our laws. Um, the, uh, the bill itself actually, as I read it, recognizes that this is not uh, a drug that we really want to promote. Um, and I think that was a fa very fair comment of one of the sponsors of the bill. It lists off the places that you do not want this drug to be uh, used or, or available. But uh, although it tries to control the distribution of the drug, it, there are other parts of the bill that undercut that goal. For example, um, uh, in section uh, 126W on page 4, it permits the redistribution of marijuana seeds, seedling plants, and uh, seedlings and plants from jurisdictions outside New Hampshire and within New Hampshire, so long as the persons distributing the marijuana are authorized by their states. But there really is no way to determine if the marijuana grown, for example, in a Massachusetts facility was actually grown in an authorized facility or if it was grown in violation of another state's laws and brought to Massachusetts. As a result, in the Attorney General's view, the efforts at general control will not have the state the desired effect. Now, to the extent that this leads New Hampshire residents into believing that medical marijuana is legal, it misleads them. Uh, section 1-6 uh, states that because states are not required to enforce federal law, quote, compliance with this act does not put the state of New Hampshire in violation of federal law. That, that simply is incorrect. Um, marijuana remains a Schedule One controlled substance under federal law. And in addition to the federal criminal laws, there are civil forfeiture laws 
that allow confiscation of property used in furtherance of trafficking contraband. So while passing this law may not put the state of New Hampshire, by passing the law, the state wouldn't be in violation. Anyone who actually tried to act under the, this change of the law would be in violation of federal law. Now, there has been some conversation uh, in a number of these um, hearings that I've been to that talks about how Attorney General Eric Holder has said that he uh, does not want to pursue um, prosecution of people who are involved in using medical marijuana. But I want to point out that this could change. It could change with a, a change in the Attorney General of the United States. Mr. Holder is a political appointee, and he could decide to leave or be asked to leave at any time. It could also change if there were a new administration. President Obama is in the second term of his, uh, of his service, and the new president may take a very different view. And even with Eric Holder's position on this, in 2011, there were Drug Enforcement Administration raids on marijuana dispensaries in Michigan, Montana, and California. In 2012, the Internal Revenue Service ruled that dispensaries cannot deduct ordinary business expenses, <coughs> some of which are listed in this bill, as requirements. For example, the dispensaries cannot deduct security expenses as a business expense for the purpose of the IRS. And with that rule, it has meant that uh, a dispensary in California wound up owing the IRS millions of dollars because they had taken these deductions. Um, the assurances uh, under Section 126W2, uh, Section 8, to physicians with respect to prosecution, for example, are meaningless under federal law. Um, the, when, when you look at some of the uh, other statements in this law, for example, 126-W2, Section 13, it states a law enforcement officer shall not provide any information to any law enforcement authority that does not recognize the protection of this chapter. There are two points here. First of all, the law enforcement officer, the person who has the marijuana must credibly assert that they have a right to the marijuana. And uh, the prohibition, but the prohibition does not create an exception for federal law enforcement. So here we have the first point. The person credibly asserts, I have the right to have this marijuana. Who makes the determination of that? Is it the officer who is talking to the person? Is it the law enforcement agency? Is it the prosecutor? Is it the court? Or is it the jury? I don't know how the officer is supposed to act on that credible assertion because in order to credibly assert something, the person has to be able to check it. The second thing is that uh, because marijuana remains illegal under federal law, the statute would put state and local law enforcement at odds with federal law enforcement. It is not clear, for example, from this legislation whether the law would prohibit compliance with a duly authorized federal grand jury subpoena for records or testimony from a law enforcement officer or agent. agency. Notably, if the restriction does apply to state law enforcement responding to federal subpoenas, the bill would require the law enforcement agency to risk contempt of court. No similar restriction applies to a landlord or an employer, by the way, who comes across the same information. Um, the, there are a number of things, the, the bill uses the phrase repeatedly, unless compliance would be a violation of federal law, and I have attached to this um, a section, 41 United States Code, section 702, which, which governs the um, administration of grant money. And it's very clear that even, even if you set aside these federal law enforcement issues, with the drug being illegal. There are other components of federal law that affect this. Um, finally, if, if you uh, look at um, some of the other aspects of the, the bill, they really do create a lot of concern. This idea that out-of-state facilities can swap marijuana with, with the facilities inside New Hampshire, to me, creates a real um, quality control issue, for lack of a better word. Uh, we don't know if the marijuana coming from out of state would be somehow laced 
we don't even know if it would be marijuana. I mean, I, I, am, I am old enough to remember the uh, Jim Croce song where he spent all night trying to get high on an ounce of oregano. We don't know what would be coming into the state and what would be being sold as, uh, as marijuana. And so we have no provision against counterfeit drugs. Um, there is a provision in this bill for record checks for the people who would be using this. I did not see the effect of those record checks in the bill. And this is a cause of great concern to me because if someone has a conviction for drug dis distribution or in the case of somebody who's actually providing the marijuana to a person who is using it, if that person has a, a conviction for sexual assault or something of that sort, there should be some prohibition against allowing these people to be involved in this, uh, in this distribution at the very least. Um, I wondered if there would be similar record checks for the patients who sought to use marijuana, if those people had convictions um, for drug addiction or something, for drug distribution or something of that sort. What, is there going to be some prohibition against that? Um, under Section 126W5, Section 2, uh, medicinal mar marijuana is not to be allowed in prison. How will this work? If a, if a prisoner says that he needs marijuana and his doctor concurs, uh, are we going to be exposing New Hampshire to civil lawsuits in respect to that? Um, finally, the one thing that I noted was under 126W3, Section 9, which is on page 9 of the bill as introduced, the family of a patient who dies must report the death within 24 hours. There's no penalty associated with the failure to do so, and there did not appear to be any other provision in the Act that penalized the failure to do so. So those kinds of things are, are minor, and, and to a certain extent with any bill, I, I, would, I would admit that the devil was always in the details, and you're, you're looking at uh, specific instances, and, and people may not have thought of everything, and it, it's why bills are amended and why people introduce new legislation after legislation has been passed. But those are generally my concerns. I, I think it is a, a concern for law enforcement in the state of New Hampshire. It creates a false impression that this legalizes a Schedule One controlled sub substance, even though it remains illegal in federal law, and I think that there are some some uh, drawbacks to the bill as it was introduced, and I apologize for not having the amendment heard. Any questions? Awesome. Someone's in public housing and paying rent. They're disabled. Do they get an exemption if there's a no smoking policy at this complex for for people? I. I hesitate to to answer that. My my gut instinct is no, but I but I don't know that for certain. That's not an area of the law that that I'm familiar with. Probably the people from Health and Human Services could give you a better answer on that than I can. And I apologize. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Attorney. Uh, the inherent contradiction I think that maybe you do must deal with on a daily basis is that the uh, opposition is all around you on this issue. I'm speaking states. There's 18 that have approved medical marijuana. What are they doing that we substantively apparently can't achieve in the state of New Hampshire that they do, but that you've just, uh, just uh, detailed why we can't? Well, I, I'm, I'm I, I want to be clear with you. I oppose the bill. I'm not saying that you cannot pass it. I'm saying that it will put New Hampshire in conflict with federal law. And to answer your question more precisely, which I think is what you're driving at, mm -hmm. is which is you know, how how can uh, these other states have passed this bill and and for a similar legislation and not be in conflict with the federal government? And I, you know, I. I think that the answer is is twofold. Um, the first is that the Attorney General of the United States has expressed uh, great reservations about going uh, using federal law enforcement to pursue people who are doing this. 
And so that has been a policy by his office in this administration. Um, I cannot tell you that that would not change with the change of an administration or the change of an attorney general. I think that the other reason that, uh, that we haven't seen any results is that this is relatively new ground. Um, and uh, I think that on, on uh, the prosecution of Al Capone, Al Capone, as probably all of you know, was prosecuted for tax evasion. Uh, they tried repeatedly to get him in the act of uh, trafficking in what was then illegal uh, contraband. And they eventually went after him uh, based on his bookkeeper's books for tax evasion. I think that the, some of these things take a while for the federal agencies to decide how they're going to respond generally. And I, I have no certainty uh, that the federal government would not change its view on this. I, I can give you an example. Um, I was a prosecutor for the federal government for many years. And with each change in administration, the discretion of the federal pr prosecutors changed. Um, for example, we, the, the federal government, the federal uh, prosecutors had something that they called, that was called the Thornburg Memo, and it was a public document. And it told federal prosecutors that if they could make out the elements of a federal offense, they had to charge the most severe offense they could charge. When Attorney General Reno came in, Attorney General Reno's view of prosecution was different, and she gave back to the federal prosecutor's discretion. But that is something that can be given and taken away. By the time that the Bush administration came back in, the Thornburg memo was reissued, and the prosecutors were told, you must charge the severest offense that you can based on the elements of the, the offense and the evidence that you've uh, with hypocrisy on parade in Washington, should the state of New Hampshire be set in our policy based on that type of leadership? Um, it's a rhetorical question. Well, I, well, I, it, it, should we? Uh, to the, I, I cannot tell you. I can tell you that our office opposes the bill. Okay. I can tell you that you can listen to our our feelings. You can accept them or reject them, um, but. The, the problem with not knowing what the implications are under federal law is that you go forward with a bill that you think offers protection to people in a variety of ways. And it's very clear from this legislation, you intend to protect these people. And it is my uh, information to you here this morning that they will not be protected under federal law. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to ask if the prime sponsor will email you a copy of the amended version of the bill and ask that you review it and send it back to me for the benefit of the committee. And here's my card. Certainly. With your comments about the most recent amendment um, and, your, and list your four or five top concerns, some of which I've got down. Um, but that would be helpful if you could do that for us. And then we can share it with, I suspect, if the chair chooses to have a subcommittee, that we will need that information. Certainly. Um, so I'm going to leave my card here for you. I'll be pleased to do oh, it. Yes, I'll, I'll come up as soon as I can. <coughs> so, and um, Representative Schlackman, we probably, if you can give her your email address, maybe we can get the electronic version to you. Certainly. And then you in turn can send it to me once you review it. <coughs> I'm represent, make sure it's the right one. What's the number of the latest iteration of the amendments? Uh, we have two the, new, the most recent version that Representative Schlackman gave you is 2013 This is a new one. Here's a new one. Yeah. Here's a new one. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not the only person who's in the dark here. <laughs> Don't waste any time on the wrong one. Oh, I have a new one. Okay, so we want to have a new one. Right. So, 0478H. 
That's the one that's generally puts the two other providers in it and ticks a numbering problem. I think I should use. Oh, I don't have it. I don't have that. Well, I get that there is an amendment that has been introduced and one that is pending. Is that correct? The pending one hasn't been introduced. So. As far as I'm concerned, it's 02218. Right, right. If you, if you can get me whatever has actually been introduced, I, I'd be uh, pleased to look at it and give you my thoughts. Very quick, because we have no one to give on for a crossover. I'm not sure you're on deadlines. Oh, I, I, I am certainly. When, when is the... Uh, the <laughs> what have we got about you? Um, yes, we've got a week in the... We've got um, roughly two weeks from today. It's too good. We can go to All right, all right, good. I have a weekend coming up. Happy reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the committee, there's a meeting that uh, we've been invited to at 12 noon at St. Paul's uh, Church. I'm not going to, I'm going to stay and continue this meeting. Some members may want to look at the Elliott Hospital uh, meeting uh, so that if, if some members want to go, we don't have to worry about it. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to stay and, and we'll continue until 1.30 when we have to go back to the Elliott Hospital. Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, um, I, I tried to get you clarity on cards because in order so that we could get um, the Honorable um, Representative from Rhode Island, who he's, was very he's, he's instrumental nice. in getting he, it nice. through Rhode Island. Well, I just wanted the other committee members to know who may leave that we have somebody with a, a state legislator from Rhode yes. Island who was instrumental in working on their law and might answer a lot of the questions that you have. And I realize the health care thing in St. Paul's is also very important, too. But this is an opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, it's up to the committee to, to make those decisions. So we'll, I'll go over here, but that passage you can stick with me over there. Richard Turns. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chan and members of the committee. My name is Richard Kearns. I'm a relatively new resident state of New Hampshire. I live in a small place called Bethlehem, which is about an hour north of here. I'm an appellate attorney. I practice law in the states of Rhode Island and uh, Massachusetts, in both state and federal courts. I was an elected representative in the state of Rhode Island for a period of 12 years. And for 18 years, I was chief legal counsel to two speakers of the House of Representatives in Rhode Island, Representatives Howard, Representatives Murphy. I'm here today to testify in support of HB 573, a bill which deals with medical cannabis. I was involved with the drafting and the passage of a similar bill in Rhode Island, which passed in 2006. It was sponsored by Representative Tom Slater of the City of Providence, a retired Marine and my friend, who suffered grievously from lung cancer, a lung cancer that ultimately claimed his life. While I will leave to others the task of describing in detail the various sections of the bill before you, I will limit my remarks to the historical and contemporary legal framework that circumscribed the issue of the federal regulation of state-sanctioned medical cannabis. That was raised by Representative Sherman and Representative McMahon earlier. As we, as we probably already know, I don't mean to be repetitious, in 1937, the federal government passed the first federal law outlawing cannabis. That was a relatively long time ago. Today, cannabis remains classified as a Schedule I federally controlled substance. In many states, under their own laws, including New Hampshire, regulated as a controlled substance and imposed criminal penalties for its use and possession and transportation and do not recognize exceptions for medical purposes. As drafted, this bill in no way interferes with the efforts of federal officials 
and the enforcement of federal statutes. And absent federal state law enforcement agreements, cooperation agreements, New Hampshire has no authority and is without jurisdiction to arrest and prosecute people for violation of federal law. They can get delegated authority to help and can participate in investigations, but they are not the charging agency. The charging agency, in most cases, is the United States Attorney's Office. In 1997, the federal arrest of patients and providers using cannabis for medical purposes permitted by California law eventually resulted in a ruling by a divided U.S. Supreme Court in Gonzales v. Wright. Gonzales, at that time, was the Attorney General for the United States, Alberto Gonzales, and Wright was a user of medically approved marijuana in California under the California statute. Now, it's important that this opinion be read carefully because it is the critical opinion that the feds rely on today in their prosecution of medical marijuana cases. Everybody asks themselves the questions. If you have a state law that provides for the use of medical marijuana in New Hampshire, why are the feds here? And that was the question that was asked in the Wright case. Wright and other respondents in that case based their claim for injunctive relief on the assertion that the banning of the use of the manufacture, the use and the possession of intrastate cannabis for medical relief was beyond the inclusive reach of the Commerce Clause. It is the Commerce Clause that is the essential link between what the feds do and what the states do in their particular statutes. And very shortly, we will have some 25 states in this country that will allow the use of medical marijuana. This was rejected. This argument was rejected by the U.S. Supreme Court in a divided opinion. For this reason only, they said that cannabis produced in the state of California could be drawn into the stream of interstate commerce and would become a part of interstate commerce and would thus fall in the Commerce Clause invoking federal jurisdiction. Under our form of government, the power is not delegated to the United States by Constitution nor prohibited to it by the states are reserved to those states or to the people. Unlike the states, the federal government does not have general police power. Only the states do. It is a government of limited enumerated powers granted by the Constitution or necessarily derived from it. In upholding the cannabis ban of the Controlled Substances Act, the Supreme Court, in a divided decision, rested its holding on the Commerce Clause by applying a 1942 case that regulated agricultural production of wheat, assuming minimal if any actual regulation, produced a similar nexus comparing the supposed increase in the supply of cannabis leading to interstate traffic to the effect of increased wheat production in the state of Ohio, voiding federal price supports that were in effect at the time. But in the cautionary language of the opinion, the justices in right questioned the wisdom of pursuing patients and providers and called on Congress to change the law and to allow for the medical use of marijuana, essentially amending the Federal Controlled Substances Act. These recommendations are very, very important and they often appear in what we call the dicta court opinion. They often telegraph a punch to us lawyers who listen to these kinds of things. It's frequently an act or will act message. In addition, and other lawyers have stressed this here this morning, the whole of the Justice Department issued new guidelines recently in 2009 allowing for the non-enforcement of the federal ban in some situations by stressing that it will not be a priority of the DOJ to prosecute patients with serious illnesses or their caregivers who are complying, otherwise complying with state laws. This situation becomes even more of an issue now with the looming sequester because they'll be, with the cut, if you can imagine, the DEA has a $3 billion annual budget. 
has some 10,000 employees, but this will impact their enforcement capacity in some, in some way. This is an evolving legal landscape. An ever-increasing number of states, probably 25 within the next year, are now recognizing the utility of medical cannabis within their own states and have premised their statutes in large part in their inherent protective police power under the Constitution. When combined with regulatory safeguards to ensure against unsanctioned non-medical uses, limiting illegal traffic, avoiding the Commerce Clause impact of right, or a congressional failure to amend the Federal Controlled Substances Act, the opportunity is right now for the federal court to rule on the efficacy of these state amendments. The sheer number of states that are striving to meet the concerns of their suffering citizens will surely force a resolution of either type. The importance of resolving this issue uh, as a treatment option, as well as the concern to avoid the desultory patchwork of inconstant state statutes, will largely drive this effort. To suggest otherwise is wishful thinking, if not outright folly. Now, under its inherent police power, New Hampshire is well aware of the need to alleviate the pain and suffering of its citizens. Contrasted against the federal law, first enacted in 1937, the opinion of a divided Supreme Court ruling based on the Commerce Clause, citing dated federal precedent involving weak price supports, to protect uh, the reluctance of the DOJ to prosecute legitimate patients and providers, the looming sequester cuts, the court's pointed request of Congress to act, and a grow quickly growing move movement among states based on their broad police power, the need to address this issue within a contemporary framework of pending cases, cases yet to be filed, in the inevitable opinion of lower courts, New Hampshire is uniquely poised uh, to protect the citizens by enacting a medical cannabis statute with effective, if not ironclad, regulatory safeguards. Now, the question was asked earlier, why can't we do this in New Hampshire? The key to doing it here, as in every state, is that the legislation which merely sets forth a broad public policy for the state to follow, has to be followed up by a very strong regulatory structure. The reason for that is that we have got to prevent it from escaping beyond those boundaries and entering a stream of interstate commerce. Having said that, you know, this is something which needs to be needs to be addressed very, very seriously. Now, in Rhode Island, we took a couple of uh, we took a couple of steps to ensure that this happens. The legislature there, as the legislature here, can require that the Department of Health, which is the lead regulatory agency under this statute, uh, would have to submit its proposed regulations back to the legislature for approval to make sure that they're rigorous enough to withstand the test of right. This is, this is very, very important. And in that process, you should ask the DEA, and the DEA should be encouraged to collaborate as a full partner in the formulation of New Hampshire regulations. This was done in Rhode Island. It was instrumental in promoting sound interagency cooperation in limiting <coughs> distribution. Additionally, this is the second step. The legislature should, con should consider creating a permanent standing oversight committee with broad stakeholder involvement to continually evaluate and make recommendations to the legislature as to all aspects of the law making changes as needed. This process of anticipating implementation problems has worked well in Rhode Island and is working well in other states. So those are two protections you might want to consider adding <coughs> to the bill which you now have. Uh, the people of uh, there have been as there have also have other questions which, which tend to, to lead to this point. The people of New Hampshire, just like the people of Rhode Island, elect its representatives to act on their behalf to care about them as well as for them. Legislators rarely deal in perfect solutions, and while risk is always present, the risk of inaction is even greater. Any law enacted can always be amended to meet changing circumstances. But perfect legislation, an illusory goal at best, should never be the enemy of a reasonable solution. 
Inevitably, the ever-evolving law has and will always carry the taint of human fallibility. As federal inaction in the face of growing unease compounds the pain of illness, we find now that the law has become unequal to the public need. New Hampshire must find such a solution, a solution that is defensible, constitutionally based on state sovereignty, and consistent with the conditions of, of our union. And uh, in closing, I would like to, uh, as I know it was done in Rhode Island, I would like to recognize the exhausting effort of the many legislators, members of this committee included, who support this bill and its progenitors, those who struggle with the regulatory detail and the substance of their decisions and their supporters, most of all, the patients like Clayton Holt, who appeared before you today, who suffer daily in great cases. I will wish you a very good time for Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative, for uh, making me drive up here to uh, live for your life stake. Well, I live up here. <laughs> well, you must have missed that. I like the tax situation. <laughs> well, stay here. Uh, uh, Representative, I wonder if you could talk, because we've had testimony from the Attorney General and uh, some of the folks representing the police as to the Rhode Island experience with the increase in marijuana use. Uh, recreationally, if you will, or uh, for non-medical purposes. In other words, they testified that there was a correlation between a medical marijuana bill and the potential increase in marijuana use among the general public. And I wonder if you could talk to that. That, that is always an anecdotal story that goes on and achieves a lot of currency among the people who, for very good reasons, object to the passage of this type of legislation. That is why I have suggested that you create a standing committee to weigh the efficacy of these contentions and see whether or not this is in fact happening. Because if it is in fact happening, you're shooting yourself in the foot because sooner or later, the feds will be knocking on your door saying you're involved in interstate commerce and they'll be back in you. So it's really to your advantage to make sure you have an ironclad regulatory process. Without that, the whole house of cards is going to collapse. Um, on the interstate commerce question, is this law, uh, is the clause in there allowing for uh, marijuana from outside the state, does that put us at higher risk of, of being scrutinized by the Fed? Assuming that that's true, it would have an effect. But that's part, of, that's part of the regulatory purpose of what we, you guys are going to be asking the regulator, the regulator to do. This has to be stopped, and ironclad regulations have to be put into place. Maybe doctors lose their licenses if they don't follow the letter of the law. Uh, you, cannot, you cannot foresee every single circumstance, but if you have a standing committee, and if you bring the DEA into the process and not consider them to be an enemy, ask them for their help, I think you can go a long way to solving those kinds of problems. A follow-up question is, let me rephrase the, the last question. Would it be safer, in the wording of this, to strike the ability, given the concerns of I can't remember whether it was the Deputy Attorney General or law enforcement on the quality of Massachusetts marijuana. Just kidding. Um, would it be safer from an interstate commerce and also from a quality or purity standpoint to keep marijuana covered by this law in state? Well, I mean, I, I, think it would, I think it would have an effect on you know, where I'm coming from, is, is preserving the integrity of the New Hampshire system, keeping it as self-contained as possible. I'm not a legislator, but I would see no harm in, in either statutory language or regulatory language that would make that more of a reality. Thank you. Thank Mr. 
based on the fact that we're, uh, we're already hearing about a situation where marijuana is being shipped interstate, it is part of the commerce in the care of both states. It is a violation of federal law to do so. How long do you think it would take, or have, have you any idea, and I know I'm looking into your crystal ball here, about how much of an impact the state of New Hampshire, and has it, done, has it happened very rapidly in other states? Are you asking me, are you presuming that there is marijuana being, because I don't know that. But I'm stating this morning in testimony. And I have a lot of notes here that Who? marijuana is being shipped from state to state. But what I heard this morning were, were statements, uh, statements without any supporting documentation, proof, evidence, just statements. That everybody's entitled to make in a legislative hearing. You know, we're not sitting here taking a look, you know, an oath and deciding we're going to tell the truth on the very surface. But if that, if that is in fact true, that needs to be minimized to the greatest extent possible because what worries me more than anything else is that you become ensnared in the commerce clause. And once you do, then you fall into the clutches of federal jurisdiction. But I'm not entirely sure that what is, you know, what was said is in fact what has actually happened. That is why in Rhode Island they have a standing committee of the legislature which sits all the time and hears from the DEA, the state police, the local law enforcement authorities as to what is actually going on. It's, it's certainly within the, within the jurisdiction of this committee and the legislature in general to require that that be done. But it's, this is not just, I, I, what I, what I want to, the impression I want to leave with all of you today is that this is not just a preference. This is absolutely key to what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to, you're going to find yourself running a follow of federal law. One of the police officers who testified here this morning, and I don't remember his name, you know, said that the passage of this law would result in, in charging the prosecution of the state law. I mean, under federal law. That's not necessarily the case. They have, the, the, the feds aren't, and whether you do it by creating a standing committee or whether you make the regulations of the Department of Health subject to your approval, you have the right to do that. In Rhode Island, there's the inevitable tension that always exists between elected representatives and the unelected bureaucrats who sometimes think they're the legislators and many times don't do what you ask them to do. So you need to have... You need to make sure that everybody's paying attention and everybody has their eye on the wall. We all have that same <laughs> I'm sure you do. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Excuse me, can I have your testimony, please? Uh, if you give me your address, I will mail it to you because mine is so mocked up with notes and what they call work product. I'll be happy to do it. Do you have a business card? Could leave the best. No, I don't. Did uh, Representative Schlafman have your contact information? Yes, she does. But I, I'll be happy to mail you. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to mail you. Thank you for coming. Okay. Well, it was an hour drive home. It wasn't too bad. The weather's a lot different up there, you know, than it is down here. Yes. Yes, sir. <coughs> Mr. Chair, I have a uh, position paper and several handouts for the committee. Members. My name is John Aconacio. I am a lieutenant with the New Hampshire State Police, and I am currently assigned as the commander of the Narcotics and Investigations Unit. I have been involved in law enforcement for 20 years. I am here representing the New Hampshire Department of Safety today 
and we oppose this bill. Before I get started, I wanted to read something that was uh, was sent to me in regards to the federal law and what's going on in other locations. This is from Stop the Stop the Drug War dot org. It came from the internet, and it pertains to DEA raids three LA medical marijuana dispensaries. This is from January 9th, 2013. I'll just uh, go through it real quick. DEA was back at raiding dispensaries again in Los Angeles today. Agents raided three Los Angeles medical marijuana dispensaries Wednesday afternoon. Federal government has unleashed the DEA on dispensaries under both the Bush and Obama administrations. Although there was a respite between 2009 and late 2011, when the Justice Department had a policy of generally leaving them alone. But that policy shifted again in 2011, and both the DEA and federal prosecutors have been busy going after dispensaries since then. One Southern California dispensary operator was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison this Monday. So this is coming from, you know, stop the drug war from an agency that isn't necessarily opposed to uh, regulation. So those things are going on out there. I testify before you today not to prevent terminally ill and chronically afflicted individuals from obtaining relief for their health-related issues. I testify before you today in order to educate you to the potential for abuse and possible negative consequences for society as a whole should the decision be made to pass this bill. It is important to note as previously stated, that is, it is the United States Food and Drug Administration, the FDA's role to approve drugs for consumption. All prescribed drugs are reviewed by the FDA, and such approval is done on a scientific basis to conform to all aspects of the Food and Drug Cosmetic Act. At the present time, the FDA approves medicine. At the current time, no FDA-approved medicines are smoked mainly due to the fact that it is a poor way to consistently deliver a controlled dosage of medicine. According to the FDA, it sees no future in smoked marijuana and sees no reason to change the scheduling of marijuana. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled repeatedly that the scheduling of drugs, including marijuana, is the responsibility of the federal government. More importantly, Mar marijuana is currently listed as a dangerous, addictive drug, listed as a Schedule I drug under the Controlled Substances Act, and it remains illegal. It has also been ruled that individuals who use marijuana for medical purposes can be prosecuted even if they are using the drug pursuant to a doctor's prescription, and that use is allowed under state law. This bill clearly sends the wrong message to our citizens. According to a Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration survey, medical marijuana legislation has led to an increase of use of drugs and addiction, <coughs> particularly among our youth. The MS Society has stated there is no convincing evidence that marijuana benefits people with MS, and they do not recommend it as treatment. The American Medical Association and most major health organizations oppose the legalization as well as the medical use of marijuana. The Institute of Medicine has concluded that smoked marijuana should not be, med should not be recommended for medical use. The drug, I believe it's Sativix, has been approved for cancer pain and has multiple sclerosis, uh, as well as multiple sclerosis, and it comprises two of marijuana's active ingredients delivered via mouth spray. Other non-smoked medications derived from marijuana, such as Marinol, have also been developed. According to the Harm Reduction Journal, the average user of smoked medical marijuana has no chronic illness and is a white male in his mid-30s with a history of alcohol and drug abuse. According to the Journal of Drug Policy Analysis, the vast majority of recommendations for marijuana as medicine are not based on medical necessity and accurate a complete diagnosis, a consideration of alternative treatments, and few seeking a recommendation for medical marijuana actually have cancer, HIV, AIDS, glaucoma, or RMS. 
an issue facing states now where medical marijuana has been legalized is that the profit margin is so great that unethical medical practitioners spring up overnight and are quite willing to accept any claim of a qualifying medical condition. Without proper planning and oversight, these fly-by-night practitioners are able to thrive in an unregulated market. This ultimately, ultimately puts more marijuana on the streets and in the hands of those seeking to get high rather than just providing pain relief to those suffering from serious medical problems. Since this bill does not restrict medical marijuana to New Hampshire residents, but also allows it to be prescribed for and furnished to non-residents, our state could become the mecca for people seeking the drug. The bill even allows marijuana to be furnished to minor children. THC, the active ingredient in marijuana, varies greatly from one plant to another. This is not like FDA-approved medications where a certain dosage can be prescribed by a doctor to accurately predict what is or what is not a safe dose if the individual is going to drive, operate machinery, care for children, or work. Social disapproval for using marijuana has been decreasing among teens for years, softening attitudes about the dangers of marijuana often precede an increase in marijuana use rates. More youth are in treatment for marijuana abuse or dependence than for alcohol and all other drugs, according to the Center for Behavioral Health Statistics and Quality. Marijuana use has been found to be higher, particularly among juveniles in states with medical, with medical marijuana laws. As the commander of the, of the New Hampshire State Police Narcotics and Investigation Unit, there are a number of issues pertaining to this bill that concern me. And you have to forgive me, Mr. Chairman, I don't have the amendment either. I was working off of what I had last night, so although I have heard some testimony, um, I'll try to address what I see fit. How does one become a designated caregiver? Who is going to be responsible for performing the necessary background checks for cardholders? While cardholders may be immune to state prosecution should the bill pass, they may still be prosecuted federally due to the fact that marijuana remains an illegal drug. Additionally, pertaining to the seizure of property on page 5, line 36, and line 1 on page 37, there is nothing stopping the federal government from seizing a person's property which is used in connection with the medical use of marijuana as allowed under this bill. Do our citizens think they will be protected from such forfeitures and seizures? And I believe that was addressed by someone from the Attorney General's office. Upon request of the federal government, particularly the DEA, the New Hampshire State Police, as well as many local agencies in the state of New Hampshire, may be faced with arresting New Hampshire citizens who believe that they are protected under state law regarding the use of medical marijuana. Once again, do our citizens think they will be protected from such actions? On page 6, Section 12 states, any cardholder who transfers marijuana to an individual who is not a cardholder under this section shall be guilty of a Class B felony. Does that mean, according to this, that a cardholder who gave a non-cardholder a joint could be subject to spending time in the New Hampshire State Prison? This, certainly, this would certainly increase the amount of people incarcerated for small amounts of marijuana. Who is going to be responsible for verifying all the information pertaining to the identification test? Where is the money going to come from to pay, for, to pay for additional time and manpower to complete state and federal rec criminal record checks on designated caregivers, alternative treatment center agents, and cardholders as required by the proposed bill? And, and another hypothetical question pertaining uh, specifically to Section 11, Paragraph B1 on page 10. For instance, we receive a tip that an individual is growing marijuana in his residence. The investigator develops enough information over several weeks to apply and obtain a search warrant for the residence through the court. The search warrant is, execu is executed only to learn that the resident is a cardholder and is allowed to grow the marijuana inside his residence. What would be put in place for law enforcement to obtain information regarding who are the cardholders in order to prevent a waste of valuable investigative time as well as a potentially dangerous situation. 
This bill requires law enforcement to obtain a, an arrest warrant or a search warrant before being able to learn if an individual has an identification card. There are so many other concerns, questions, and potential far-reaching consequences pertaining to this bill. I could go on for hours. Should this bill pass, who is going to be responsible for writing our re regulations? Who will implement and enforce these regulations? I have not done any additional research. However, I believe that the costs cited in the fiscal notes are much less than what would actually be needed to run a medical marijuana program. I highly doubt that such a program could be run with only the cost of a database, a licensing clerk, and a program specialist. That is troubling. More importantly, however, and even more troubling, are the societal costs and the consequences to our youth. That will be the most costly effect of passing this bill. Thank you for listening to me, and I'll answer any questions you may have. Um, just a quick question. You've mentioned if in that page six where it becomes a class B felony. What would, what would currently happen? It doesn't say sale, it just says transfer. So that would be possession, is that correct? Yes. So what is that under state statute? Is that a misdemeanor? Civil possession? It's a misdemeanor right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for coming, Senator Johnson. Thank you. I have uh, just one, it's really a rhetorical question, but uh, let me get to it. The situation you just called about the research and going to doing a drug raid in the UK, and you find out that the person has a cop. Yes. I know the answer to this question, everybody in this room knows the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask it for the record anyway. Sure. What happens when the life of one officer is lost because of such a situation? It's never going to reach that point where it's acceptable. Is it? It's unacceptable. Correct. Thank you. <coughs> Any other question? <coughs> um, can you think of a case <coughs> where you personally would condone medical marijuana if all the other treatments didn't work. The case where I would personally condone it? Yeah. If it was your wife that was suffering, and all the other medical marijuana, uh, medical medicines didn't work, would you condone it? I can't answer that, Representative, yes or no. Although you did hear from someone who was in that exact situation with his son. Earlier, and, uh, and he told you how he felt. Uh, I can't even imagine putting myself in his shoes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are you um, advocating for criminal background checks for caregivers or for those who are growing marijuana at home? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to, to reiterate some of the points that have already been made, uh, particularly by the last gentleman. I agree. Should this bill go forward, there has to be a strict regulatory commission and process set up. Um, I would be more than happy to give my insight and my input uh, you know, going forward. I have not had anybody reach out to me uh, as far as uh, my opinion. I don't know if anyone's reached out to anybody else within the Division of State Police or the Department of Safety other than possibly Commissioner Sweeney. I deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. I run our narcotics unit. I have undercover people. I have diversion people. We're out every day enforcing uh, violations of 318B, which is the uh, Controlled Drug Act of the state of New Hampshire. I'd be more than happy to, to weigh in my opinion and what I see. And anyone who knows me knows. I'll tell you the, the, the way it is. I'm not going to put a spin on it. You can take it or, or leave it. to is if we're going to set up a system 
where people are going to be issued cards to to uh, be prescribed marijuana. Yes, I, I think that there should be some kind of regulations put in place. Be that yes, be that a, a criminal background check um, due to the problem with what we have seen with diversion. Physicians don't prescribe medical marijuana. No, but what I meant is a patient who was given. Um, they, they won't do anything. It's, it's, it's not part of the legislation. I think that's confusing. Do we have a question? Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Concerns surrounding the concept of House Bill 573. Uh, the first of which is that we are unsure if marijuana is actually medicine. Um, this point has been brought up before, but um, we were just wondering that if it is medicine, why isn't there a non smoked version of it that has the exact same effect as the smoked version without having the risks of the smoking? Also, we are confused why, if it is medicine, that it remains illegal under federal law, and we wonder why it hasn't been recognized by the Food and Drug Administration, as all other medicines we take are. And this makes us wonder if the science around marijuana is really settled. Um, now, provided that you do decide that the science is conclusively showing that marijuana is medicine, uh, we feel that the passing of this bill would be acceptable, provided that marijuana is treated just as any other prescription drug, such as Oxycontin. Um, and similar to any other medicine that would be on the market today, uh, we feel that it should be proven effective before it would be acceptable for medicinal use. And as you probably know, um, in Colorado, medical marijuana is legal, and a doctor may prescribe marijuana for minor illnesses and term terminal diseases alike. And this has resulted in the abuse of these prescriptions and widespread recreational use. According to a CBS News segment aired on 60 Minutes last fall, in Denver alone there are over 200 dispensaries. So a person could theoretically receive their prescribed amount from every single one of those dispensaries every time the prescription was due for a refill. And we obviously want to avoid this kind of situation in New Hampshire. So we believe that if marijuana was to be legalized for medicinal use, it should be strictly regulated. Uh, now, first of all, we, want, we feel that marijuana should only be provided to people with conditions that the drug has clearly been shown to improve. Um, it should be illegal for a doctor to prescribe this medicine, this marijuana, for <coughs> conditions that are outside of a very narrow set. We also feel that standalone dispensaries for marijuana, as seen in Colorado, send the wrong message. If it is to be used legitimately as a prescription medicine, it should be treated as such and be distributed through legitimate pharmacies. Um, now, if there are other drugs without marijuana side effects, then marijuana should not be prescribed. Like, for example, every 19-year-old with a toothache should not be able to get an unlimited supply of marijuana. <coughs> Um, marijuana may or may not relieve pain, but it does also have a variety of severe effects on the body, such as panic attacks, um, anxiety, paranoia, depression, lung damage, and dependence. We also don't want kids and teens to associate marijuana with being healthy. We are wary of youth viewing the drug as a cure for pain or illness. By legalizing medicinal use of marijuana, it creates a parallel between marijuana and being healthy, and we believe this this could send the wrong message to naive youth. Uh, now, in conclusion, we have strong reservations about potential problems that passing this bill would cause. 
Uh, we don't want to seem heartless and deny something that would help a terminal patient in agony. If marijuana really helps that person, if it is really medicine, we wouldn't be opposed to allowing them to use it to treat their illness. But we also feel we need to be careful that we don't provide a way for these potential concerns to become an issue that makes the drug problem worse than it already is. Uh, now, we would ask the legislature and this committee to be very cautious when deciding on House Bill 573, because even if marijuana could potentially help an ill patient, there are many complications to our whole society that go along with it that need to be considered as well. Thank you for your time, and we have copies of our testimony, and if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Is anybody from your school here with you? Or? Um, all these kids back here. <laughs> I want to tell the faculty that they should report back how impressive this was. We really like to see students to know like that. You've done a lot of research and very thoughtful, and your presentation was clear and synchronized, I think, too. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the committee? Make sure you call your local representatives. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's the next 10 in a row all uh, support this, um, all support this bill. We, we've got about 45 minutes left so that um, we're at the stage where some, somebody may have already said everything you wanted to say. That doesn't mean you shouldn't get up, but uh, if, if you can try to avoid repetitious uh, kinds of comments, we'd appreciate it. Uh, and so we'll... Keep right on going. Uh, Susan, is it Bonnie? Yeah. It may be me. Looks like half of our Does it look like Bruce? Okay. Susan Bonnie? Does it look like Bruce? Bruce. It is Bruce. Oh, yeah, that would be me. Okay. <laughs> My name is Susan Bruce, and I live in Dumbarton. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I support this bill for a number of reasons, not the least of which is my late husband, David Emerson, who died in 2009. He had multiple myeloma, a cancer of the bone marrow and blood plasma, uh, the same cancer that Evelyn Merrick has. Uh, his doctor, his oncologist, was from Maine and horrified that medical marijuana was non-existent in New Hampshire. He was given more, um, endless prescriptions of oxycontin that didn't really help the pain. Uh, in early 2009, he had to have surgery because his cervical spine had deteriorated to the point where his head very nearly fell off his neck and would have re resulted in paralysis. So a uh, titanium pepper structure was put into his neck and fused to the bone that was left there. He had to go through a three-week course of radiation because they wanted to keep that bone that was fused to as healthy as possible. So for three weeks, he had radiation aimed at his neck. It caused everything that he ate or drank to taste strongly of sheet metal, and he was weak and didn't want to eat or drink, and needed desperately, too, uh, to keep up the strength for the course of radiation. It was awful. And one of his friends finally came over with some marijuana, and he found that he was able to at least eat and drink a little bit. Um, he had been very resistant to <coughs> using it as somebody that had been kind of a hippie drug user in the 60s. He wasn't eager to return to that. Um, it's interesting that I'm here before you because I'm, a, I'm an addict. I'm a recovering alcoholic and substance abuser. I haven't had a drink or a drug in 23 years. Um, so the irony of testifying on behalf of medical marijuana is not lost on me. I was also uh, uh, an instructor in our state's impaired driver program, the program that you have to go through if you get a uh, DUI in our state. 
I taught for about five years, and during that time, I saw maybe five cases of people who were there for marijuana-related offenses. Mostly it was drunk drivers. Um, it was never anything else. When David was taking a lot of Oxycontin, I asked his doctor at one point if he should be driving, and they all looked at me like, oh my, what a thought. Nobody, had, it never occurred to them that perhaps prescription drugs were as dangerous as alcohol or marijuana might be. Um, that was pretty horrifying to me because, as I said to my husband later, I didn't see any difference between him knocking down a bunch of Oxycontin and him knocking down a quart of vodka. So, um, the point that I want to make is that this is a humane issue. It's a humanity issue. Um, David shouldn't have had to suffer and feel like, a, like he was breaking the law to get through a course of radiation. He wasn't about to be going down to the schoolyard to sell drugs, especially after the titanium infrastructure was put in because he couldn't move his head, so he couldn't drive anymore, but still. Um, we treat our dying pets better than we treat our dying people. And really, that's all I have to say. And <coughs> thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Teresa Earl. Hi, thank you for giving me the chance to speak about this today. Um, I support this bill as a medical marijuana patient who has PTSD and has been with it for a decade. I've tried every available part of the option that was made available to me, and none of them worked. I checked myself into rehab when marijuana did work because I thought it was a drug addict. There, I was told by the healthcare providers there to continue smoking because I am having significantly better life, a significantly better and more healthy life because of the fact that I smoke marijuana. I also have two children. And I have never had, and I have no criminal record, other than a couple speeding tickets. Sorry about that. But <clears throat> in reality, I resent having to come up here and speak with you. I resent having to ask permission about choices that I know are better for me, better for my family, and better for the environment. I used to sell antidepressants. I used to talk to physicians and doctors all the time. I've read the data. I know what I'm talking about. I don't need your permission. I need you to listen to the people who elected you. 78% of the people in New Hampshire want medical marijuana available. That's not a request, that's a mandate. You don't work for the federal government, you work for the people of New Hampshire. So I beg you, please pass this. I don't want to live my life like a criminal. I am an adult woman, I'm an educated woman. I make decisions for myself every day, I make decisions for my children every day. I've been promoted at my job twice in the past year. Not because I can't handle my medicine. Oh, which brings me to this. I resent the implication that cannabis may not be a medicine. And when I heard that, I decided to look it up. So according to the Oxford Dictionary, medicine is a drug or other preparation for the treatment or prevention of disease. I would say, since <laughs> cannabis is part of the drug war, that makes it a drug, which by the definition of the word medicine meets that standard. So I will not be calling it an herbal, herbal remedy or anything else. It is a medication, it is an effective medication, not just for PTSD, but for cannabis, glaucoma, MS, autism, seizures. Look it up. A thousand years of data support the use of medical marijuana. 150 studies have been done in the last 10 years. This is ridiculous. So I appreciate immensely you giving me the opportunity to speak. I hope you'll pass this law and at the same time, I resent it. If I can answer any questions, I'm happy to do that. Thank you very much. All right, just Pam. I do have a presentation for the committee, which I will leave with you. Okay. I'm not going to read it. Don't worry. But there are enough <laughs> copies for everything. If you don't mind, I'm going to stand. I have a chronic pain condition, and obviously I've got the right name to talk on this subject. 
I've got a chronic pain condition that is eased by being able to move around. So if you don't mind, I will. But I won't speak for long. I'd like to point you in a slightly different direction. This thing to some of the people who have spoken this morning, I feel I'm a lucky person. I don't suffer from any life-threatening disease or condition. But I've done a few things in my life. I'm a veteran. I was a banker for about 20 years. I was then a regulator of banks for another 15 plus years. Forced to go on disability because of a chronic pain condition that began about 20 years ago. And I've literally been through every legal form of treatment for chronic pain that I'm aware of. I'm not just here, in fact, I'm a relatively new transplant to New Hampshire. But in Connecticut, where I was, in New York, where I worked, all kinds of treatments, uh, which are outlined in detail, by the way, in that memorandum, and which you don't really want me to list. They didn't work. In fact, the condition got worse. And that's what forced me to disability, which means, of course, my contribution to my employer, myself, to my family, to my community, became progressively less and less. Now, I know I'm not unique in this way, but chronic pain is a disabling condition, and it means that the people who experience it, at the very least, are very uncomfortable. But it also means that their contribution to the world we live in can't be what it should be, what they are capable of. And that's the point I want to draw to your attention. If I had not been forced by the legal regime covering pain control drugs, I would not be on prescription narcotics. The side effects of the prescription narcotics and the other things that have gone with it, again, they're all in there. Um, the side effects have taken a, a larger portion of my living day. Okay, that's great for me. But it also means that I cannot produce and contribute to the world we live in. That's what I really want to draw your attention to, because I believe that if medical marijuana had been available, I would not be here today talking to you. I would be out contributing, and that's where I want to be, and have always wanted to be. That's really all I have to say. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them or respond to your inquiries. My contact information is there. Uh, is there hey, thank you for being here. Uh, are you utilizing marijuana now? No. So, uh, okay, I just want to follow up. Uh, the reason I asked was I wanted to have some testimony of before and after. That's why I was asking. I can't help you with that. I'm sorry. Can't. Is it something, though, that you are considering? If it was legal, yes. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next one. Mr. Chairman, Honorable Committee, for the record, my name is Matt Simon. I live in Gosstown. I work as a legislative analyst for the Marijuana Policy Project. And I've been working in support of this legislation on and off since 2008 through this committee several times, also in the Senate 
Uh, so there have been a lot of questions that have come up that I feel like I, I could answer for the benefit of the committee. I didn't make a comprehensive list. I'm going to hit a few high points, but I would encourage you to ask me any specific questions you have about the bill or the amendment or policy in general. Uh, briefly introducing myself. I identify with the kids that came up and testified, and I appreciated their testimony. I remember being in high school and thinking marijuana was a terribly dangerous drug, that it killed brain cells, that it caused cancer, that it was going to make all my friends stupid and unproductive citizens. I gave them a hard time about it, told them they should quit. And then, well, many of them graduated with better grades than I did, went off to better colleges than I went to, and to this point are uh, perhaps more successful than I am. Uh, in college, my freshman year, I had a friend that was writing a paper on marijuana policy, should marijuana be legal or not, because back in the 90s, that was the only question we hadn't heard of. Should it be available for medical use? I started doing some research. It was much harder to research this in the early 90s. There was no internet. There was no Google find it. It was go to the library, dig through journals, try to find articles that are actually, you know, real information. I was astonished by what I was able to find. One of the major things that jumped out at me was marijuana was available as a medicine in the United States from the mid-1800s until 1937 when it was made illegal. It wasn't called marijuana, it was called cannabis, because that is the scientific name. So I've got a, a two-page brief overview of history. This was a medicine that was discovered by uh, doctors in England. It was discovered by the West, by doctors traveling in India and China, and observing its use. They came back in the mid-19th century, wrote articles, and it became uh, a pharmaceutical. Uh, it was added to the U.S. Pharmacopoeia in 1870. In 1914, the first federal drug law was passed uh, regulating narcotics. Marijuana was not included under that. It was discussed, should we include marijuana and cannabis, and, and that was rejected in 1914. And of course, there was, from 1920 to 1932, alcohol prohibition. And when that ended, some of the individuals who had been uh, federal employees working on alcohol prohibition turned their sights to trying to make marijuana illegal and they campaigned against uh, marijuana trying to get passage of the Marijuana Tax Act which did pass Congress in 1937. Most people do not realize this. The American Medical Association opposed the Marijuana Tax Act in 1937. There's a section of the letter quoted on the timeline since the medicinal use of cannabis has not caused and is not causing addiction, the prevention of the use of the drug for medicinal purposes can accomplish no good end whatsoever. How far it may serve to deprive the public of the benefits of a drug that on further research may prove to be of substantial value, it's impossible to foresee. And I think that letter is very prescient and predicted what happened over the next eight years. In 1942, marijuana was removed from the pharmacopoeia. Uh, it was from that point on, no longer in medical textbooks, no longer would people in medical school learn about it. It was merely a drug that people smoke to get high and, and no medicine. Um, interestingly, it wasn't until 1964 that scientists learned what the psychoactive component was, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC. And it wasn't really within the, until the last 10 years that scientists began to understand how THC works, why it has an effect in our bodies. It turns out that throughout our bodies are two types of receptors, uh, the CB1 and CB2 receptor, and this is called our endocannabinoid system. Our body, it turns out, produces substances very similar to THC, which bind to CB1 and CB2 receptors throughout our body. And I've heard testimony from physicians that it's actually the most common and numerous receptor in the human body, that it connects with various body systems in ways that scientists are just now really beginning to learn about on a higher level. In the 70s, as marijuana was used more recreationally, individuals with, substance, with conditions such as glaucoma found that they were receiving relief from, from it. And the medical benefits were rediscovered in, in the 70s, really through the recreational back door. Uh, 
for reasons which I think make sense in, in retrospect. Physicians weren't allowed to know about or recommend these substances. So is marijuana medicine? Well, in 1970, the Controlled Substances Act passed. Marijuana was put in Schedule I, which means high degree of uh, abuse potential and no accepted medical use. Did it belong in Schedule I? Well, a lot of people said no right out the bat. There, there were several petitions filed to have it rescheduled right away. Uh, the DEA was put in charge of hearing those petitions, and they decided not to even listen to the petitions until 1987, uh, when the DEA's chief administrative law judge held a series of hearings and sought expert testimony uh, on, a, on a petition to move marijuana to Schedule II, make it available for medical use. And that's my next handout is uh, the one that says DEA judge ruled denying patients would be unreasonable, arbitrary, and capricious. After hearing from physicians nationwide, hearing from patients, hearing from law enforcement, uh, he found that marijuana should be moved to Schedule II. And in, you know, some of this is just astonishing. We hear, we don't know if marijuana is safe or not. We don't know if it's safe. It hasn't been approved by the FDA. Uh, just this week, the CDC released the, the, the latest numbers uh, from 2010. In 2010, for the 11th consecutive year, uh, prescription drug overdoses deaths are up again, 11 straight years of that number increasing. And another year, of course, with zero overdose deaths being attributed to cannabis. Um, number eight here in the findings on the DEA judge, he, he estimates that marijuana is LD50, which is the lethal dose, what would be a lethal dose for half, half of the people. Uh, and they estimate that it's something like 1 to 20,000 or 1 to 40,000. In layman's terms, this means that in order to induce death, marijuana smoker would have to consume 20 to 40,000 times as much marijuana as contained in one marijuana cigarette. So he concludes, in its natural form, marijuana is one of the safest therapeutically active substances in the demand. So why didn't marijuana get rescheduled in 1988? Reason, the DEA administrator, Scott Lawn, an unelected bureaucrat, said, no, I'm not going to reschedule it. <coughs> I'm sorry. Six years of court cases, 1994, federal court rules that, yes, the DEA administrator does have that authority to tell his own law judge, never mind you had those hearings, you were not going to move marijuana out of Schedule 1. And once that authority was upheld, all the people nationwide who have been fighting for this, especially in California, which is really the, the home of the, the medical marijuana movement, and the reason for that was the AIDS crisis more than any other reason. Patients in San Francisco uh, were finding that marijuana benefited with a, a whole variety of symptoms associated with AIDS, wasting syndrome, neuropathy, being able to uh, alleviate nausea so that they can continue to eat and keep their weight up. Um, so in 1996, two years after the feds after that avenue proved not to be an effective avenue, that's when states decided we need to protect our citizens. This is a federal prohibition. It's falling entirely to the states to prosecute these laws. 99% of drug arrests are made on the state and local level, not by federal law enforcement. As we've heard, the federal government does not have a general police power. It's, it's certainly developed a larger police power with the war on drugs. Uh, but as a matter of practical effect, it's patients in New Hampshire have nothing to fear from the federal government. They have everything to fear from state and local law enforcement. As a matter of policy with marijuana, the federal government does not get involved in cases where there are fewer than 100 plants or a large amount of marijuana being trafficked. That's a fairly bright line, according to the defense attorneys I, I've talked to. If you're under 100 plants, it's a state case. If you're over 100 plants, the feds might have the resources be able to deal with you. But to think that they're going to move in and start arresting patients or caregivers, that hasn't happened in any of the states where this is legal. Home cultivation is legal in 14 states. Medical marijuana laws have passed in 18 states plus D.C. I'm not aware of any case where the federal government has arrested or prosecuted a patient or a caregiver who's only growing a limited number of plants under these laws. Where the feds have expressed Concerns is about the distribution 
and dispensaries. As we've heard, there are still raids happening in places like California. Why are medical marijuana dispensaries being raided in California? Well, I think the answer is that there is absolutely zero regulation of uh, medical marijuana dispensaries in California. And I'm skipping ahead a few handouts, but it's one that says how HB 573 differs from California's Prop 215. There is, first of all, no restriction on what conditions a person can qualify for in California. There is a list of conditions in the initiative, but it, it ends with the phrase, or any other condition as recommended by a physician. So if you hear somebody's getting marijuana for a sore ankle in California, that could be true. There's nothing to prevent that doctor from writing that recommendation. However, I think it's totally unfair to hold that against this bill, which certainly doesn't permit marijuana to be recommended for non-serious conditions. Um, so in 1999, Congress asked the Institute of Medicine to review all of the available literature on marijuana's medicinal benefits. That's this handout, uh, Marijuana and Medicine Assessing the Science Base. It was a report that they came out with, and they said, yes, there are some limited circumstances in which we recommend smoking marijuana for medical uses. And they talk about the therapeutic benefits of cannabinoids and how it's an emerging science. And they do say very clearly that they have concerns about smoking. The Institute of Medicine is concerned about smoking being a way to ingest marijuana. And that is a reasonable concern. Inhaling smoke does cause some amount of respiratory damage. People who smoke marijuana heavily have increased risk of chronic bronchitis, which is not something we want. But at the same time, it was widely believed until after this report that marijuana did cause lung cancer, emphysema, COPD, things along those lines. In 2006, the largest study of its kind, which had been tracking people over the course of decades, and that's this Washington Post article, the study finds no cancer or marijuana connection. The researchers believed that they were going to find increased incidence of lung cancer in individuals who used marijuana heavily over time. And shockingly, they did not. Despite the fact that they're inhaling carcinogens, there was something that prevented them actually from getting cancer, and they got cancer at a slightly less rate, lower rate, than people who did not smoke at all, which is shocking. Um, how to explain that? Well, there are studies showing that cannabinoids can kill cancer cells in, in test tubes and petri dishes. Am I saying marijuana cures cancer? I certainly don't think smoking marijuana will cure your cancer, but I think that there's, it's an area of research that certainly should be looked into. Cannabinoids are killing cancer cells and telling them not, well, rather than killing them, in, instructing them not to replicate, which is it, 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 if a cancer cell gets the message to die off rather than re replicate, that, that would be a good thing. And of course, I'm not a doctor, but that's my understanding. Um, so I'd encourage you to read that, of course, and I think this is a, the Institute of Medicine's overview is, is very uh, helpful in understanding where things were in 1999. I think since then we've learned that the risks of smoking are not quite what they thought they were. I think we, the other significant development would be the development of vaporizers. They urge the development of a rapid onset way to ingest medical marijuana. And I mean, the benefit of smoking is that it works instantly, as opposed to taking a pill or eating brownie that may take, a, 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 I'm sorry, an hour or maybe two to kick in. And once you've ingested it, you can no longer control or titrate the dosage. Patients who smoke or vaporize are able to take a couple of puffs, and they can feel if they're where they need to be or not. If they still have pain or nausea, they might keep going, and if they don't, they stop. Uh, again, there's no risk of overdose, unlike really most of the, the drugs that physicians prescribe today. So th that is a mitigating factor on, on the safety side. Um, so we've heard that I hear often that law enforcement is opposed to this. Last year, uh, Senator Forsythe and one of his interns called through many police chiefs. I don't know how many and asked for their comments on the bill. 
I don't know the exact numbers, but there were a good number of police chiefs in New Hampshire who said they have no problem with this privately. But, but to say so publicly would, would, would be something they're not willing to do. We do have written testimony submitted on behalf of John Tomasi, uh, who is an economics professor now, but is a former uh, a retired police sergeant, a former member of the New Hampshire Drug Task Force. Um, I have an editorial that was published by a gentleman named Ron Mitchell. Uh, Ron was, was a Vietnam veteran. He was shocked when he went to his doctor, who was one of the leading pain doctors in the state. He thought he was going to have to get a morphine pump put in his abdomen, but instead his doctor said, no, you should start using marijuana. This bill is probably going to pass. This was 2009. Uh, Ron, after the bill didn't pass, moved to Vermont. He's got his little grow room. He's doing quite well. <coughs> And he unfortunately wasn't able to come today. He had to go to a funeral down in Pennsylvania. So I brought you his editorial from last year. Uh, I've got editorials by the National Telegraph, the Portsmouth Herald. Last year, I think it was five state newspapers endorsed the bill. And that is all I'm going to say for now, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Simon, you, you've heard all the testimony here today, and obviously for many years. Are there any major issues that the testimony that you consider valid that existing in this bill that still need to be addressed? or have they been covered? Thank you for the question. By the bill, if you mean the amendment, <laughs> the amendment is the bill that I believe was being submitted last fall, and that, you know, that the amendment plus the numbering uh, issue that, that we found the other day and, and a couple of technical cleanups. Overall, I think that bill is, is, is a very good bill, and most of the details I would encourage the committee to consider. Uh, I heard earlier today Dr. Savage said that we should negotiate with law enforcement and, and come up with something that works. I've been trying to negotiate with law enforcement since 2009. They've been invited to every meeting. I've sat down with Chief Crate for two hours at a time. We've incorporated his comments into this bill over the course of last year and previously based on his comments. But here's the trouble with trying to negotiate with the Chiefs of Police Association. Last year, in the Concord Monitor, Chief Crate was quoted saying, it's a bad bill, and the only way to make it better is to take marijuana out of it. That isn't a negotiating position, okay? I, we are open to any kind of feedback. I've always tried <coughs> to have an open mind and an open ear to where those folks are coming from, but unfortunately, they have not been willing to negotiate with us. And if that changes, I'm all ears, but I, I don't think it will. Anybody else? Follow up? Follow up? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know the source where I read this, but there was an interview with the governor about medical marijuana in which, I'm probably paraphrasing liberally, she expressed concern for the ability of a patient to grow marijuana for their own use. Do you have any feelings about that? I have strong feelings that patients should be allowed to do that. But it's a tremendous cost savings to them to be able to do it, especially if they have long-term needs, something like multiple sclerosis, where they may live another 30 or 40 years but be managing their symptoms. I think it's very important. Uh, Patients in Maine and Vermont are allowed to grow their own plants. I have heard zero problems reported from either of those states uh, in previous hearings when opponents have been asked, have you heard any problems from Maine or Vermont? The answer is always no, but California, but California. So we're always, you know, yes, there are, there are problems with California's law. It fits on one page. There's no state regulation of dispensaries. You're going to have issues with, with that. This bill creates a maximum total cap of five uh, alternative treatment centers in the entire state. 
and they are very thoroughly regulated by the Department of Health and Human Services. We've seen that in states that do regulate dispensaries, there have been no raids, there have been no interventions from the federal government. It's in states, the ones mentioned, where California, uh, Montana, and I believe Michigan, and none of those states have any regulated dispensary framework at all. In California, it all fell to the, to the local, the county, the town governments to regulate or not regulate <coughs> dispensaries. In Berkeley, for example, in San Francisco, they regulated their dispensaries. They're much better run. In LA, nobody even knows where they are. It's unbelievable. That's not what we're asking for here. And finally, I, I realize this isn't a question, but I thought of something I really need to bring up. Uh, the gentleman from the Governor's Commission on Alcohol and Drug Abuse said that states where medical marijuana laws have passed have experienced spikes in teen use. Well, there are two major national government surveys on exactly this question. And give me the de details from one of them. Uh, bottom line is it's not true. And the government's own data says it's not true. Now, there is, think about this one. The states that passed medical marijuana laws tended to be states on the West Coast. Uh, which had higher than average marijuana use to begin with, including higher teen use. Since marijuana, medical marijuana laws have passed, teen use rates have stayed the same or gone down in all of these, all of these states. And it's not just my analysis of that data. There are several independent researchers who have looked at the same data. And one of them is included on my front page. There's a quote from a California pediatrician where a doctor writes, you can read it for yourself, but you know, there's, it's not the case that there's a spike in teen use after these things happen. Uh, the average was higher to begin with in California and Oregon, and it's gone down since these laws passed. And that's despite California, again, having no regulations whatsoever. In a state like Vermont, where it's very tightly regulated, there's, there's, there's not been any spike at all. There are only 600 patients in Vermont. Thank you very much. Sure. Is there an estimate or ac ac accurate figures that anyone could give us as to just how many patients, should this become a law, <coughs> would benefit or who would use, perhaps, um, medicinal marijuana? It's difficult to get a precise estimate, particularly since every bill, the, the definition of who qualifies has changed throughout the process. Uh, in Vermont, we've seen that it's only about 600 patients right now, and the bill has been law since 2004, but expanded in 2007. <coughs> if we do a population, uh, increase that for the factor of population difference, that'd be about 1,000, you know, probably between 1,000 and 2,000 patients in New Hampshire would be my guess based on how it goes. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now have about 10 minutes and we still have six people, so that we can go slow on the questions unless they're getting questions. So we can get through it. We've got a bunch of six sessions. Kirk, is it? McNeil? Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Submit written testimony and then. Uh, Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Kirk McNeil, and I am with NHCompassion.org. We've been advocating for the rights of people who would like to see medical marijuana here for several years. Uh, Matt Simon was my predecessor in this organization. He has said most of the things that I think you want to hear. Um, I want to make it very clear that we are open to anything that we can do to help you as you work through this legislation. I know that legislation of this sort and then the regulations that come after it are difficult things to work with. We've heard a lot of testimony in that regard already today. There are just a few quick points that I want to make, and one is that nobody that I know of who is an advocate for the use of medicinal marijuana 
is trying to say, everybody ought to have medical marijuana. What we want is for doctors, for caregivers, and for patients to have another tool in their toolbox to work with when they're treating people who might be helped by the use of medicinal cannabis. Just as if I went to a doctor with high blood pressure and three of you all went to the same doctor with high blood pressure, we might receive three different medications or three different recommendations for behavioral changes that might reduce our blood pressure. I don't believe for a minute that a doctor who is practicing the way they were taught to practice is just going to start recommending marijuana wholesale. They're going to look at their patient, they're going to look at that patient's lifestyle, their family circumstances, and they're going to come up with a course of recommendation for that person that will enable them to treat the disease or the ailment at hand. We heard some testimony from Dr. Savage that said, well, we don't have enough time with our patients. We don't have enough time with this. We don't have enough time. Well, I can't fix that problem. Take the time. Or don't take the time. Be a bad doctor. But <laughs> I don't know any other way to say that. The saying the system is broken, so please keep the system the way it is, to me is, it, it's dumbfounding. I was, I was struggling not to laugh in the back of the room. I've never heard an argument like that put forth in a serious manner. This is broken, so please don't fix it. <coughs> what we want is for doctors and patients to have a tool in their toolkit, something that they can use if the situation warrants it. I don't expect this is going to be the last time we talk about medical marijuana legislation. Even if this passes and passes the Senate and goes through the governor's office, I expect that two years from now we may be sitting around this room, some of the same faces, saying, gosh, we need to do an amendment to this law. Because in the past two years we found that this thing changed and that thing changed and this wasn't quite what we expected it to be. That is the nature of this system, that we can adapt and progress and change as we need to to better meet the needs of the citizens of the state of the country. And so I ask you to study this, look at all the various amendments, ask any questions that you may have, but ultimately, medicinal marijuana is something that ought to pass. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Dennis Acton. Half or five, I'll use two and a half. My name is Dennis Acton, I live in Fremont. Um, I'm actually a former state Senate candidate in District 20, the newly formed District 23. I lost pretty handily in the uh, uh, primary, but can't fault the guy for trying. Um, basically, in 1998, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Uh, I noticed the problem on Wednesday, and I was under the knife by the following Monday and into radiation treatments within three weeks. Um, so obviously, I didn't have time for cultivation or anything like that when I got into my treatments. Um, and, and that's why I feel it's so important to have the, the um, alternative treatment center language in this bill. There's so many people like me who you get a lightning fast um, diagnosis and then before you even know it, you're already into the, into the treatment and so forth. So the alternative uh, treatment center would be very important if I had the ability to go and speak to someone. Um, we heard earlier that it was, um, a, not, um, it was an offense to dignity to, to do that. That's, well, in my case, I had to sneak out behind the house because we were living with relatives who didn't approve of it. I had to sneak out behind the house to use marijuana during my radiation treatments. That's um, an affront to dignity. Um, so that, that part of the legislation is very important. And I think a grow your own only would do a disservice to the hundreds of people like me who, who have the, these life um, transforming uh, diagnoses come up. Uh, Final um, part is uh, years later now, um, I was diagnosed two years ago with, with glaucoma. So now I'm into a situation where I have to take medicine for the rest of my life. Um, I've already had significant damage to my ocular nerve. Um, there is a possibility that medical marijuana will help me. I, I look forward to being able to speak to my doctor about that and then go into a situation where if it works, I can cult cultivate that myself so I don't have to spend it. Uh, the worst thing I think could happen is to let Big Pharma take this over. Uh, I have a friend who pays $1,600 a month for Embril for his, um, his uh, psoriatic arthritis. He can't afford that. I think if you let the uh, big pharma take over, it's going to be similar expense. And uh, this needs to be kept small. And, and, and finally, um, as a patient, I look forward to taking part in this, in this 
in, in helping with, say, uh, patient advocacy groups and, and the, um, say the committee that was mentioned before, there's a lot of patients who want to make sure this works. We're not going to let it spin out of control and get taken advantage of by out of state profiteer and so forth. So there will be a strong patient movement to help um, self-police this, this and help um, you know, do peer counseling to, to other people. So I just wanted to let you know that. Now, thank you for, for listening. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Wilson? Are you Devin Chafee? Darling Wilson. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. I've spoken before you before. My situation has not changed much, except my weight has obviously lowered more. And that will keep happening. I've tried everything now from the Dronabinol to the Marinol to whatever they'll give me that's legal. And uh, nothing, I'm losing ground at this point. Nothing is working. And my doctors have told me, quite frankly, at this point, marijuana is the only thing, preferably the ingestibles, not necessarily the smokable kind because there's all kinds of ways to um, deliver it and use delivery systems. They say that on a lot of the cancers and, and um, heart and sicknesses like that, ingesting it does work better than smoking it. So, um, but I know at this point, if it's not legalized soon, I'm either going to have to move to another state, which I really don't want to do, because all the states northeast where I come from our ice cold, and that's kind of picturing a warm place in my old age, but um, so I appeal to you once again to please reconsider and, um, and um, look at the scientific data that's on it. There's so much on the internet now. Our bodies, I just found out, are actually predisposed to cannabinoids. They're in our brain, they're in our liver, they're in our pancreas. I have chronic cystic pancreatitis. And I have hopes that maybe if I can someday get it legalized and ingested, that maybe I can start a repair process on my pancreas. I've lost so much weight now I can't have an operation. I lose too much weight and I wouldn't survive. And that, that's my only hope at this point, actually. And my doctors are willing to speak to anybody who has questions. They put his, my doctors put his name and number on his letters he submitted to you. Um, he runs a pain clinic in a hospice center in Dover, New Hampshire. One of the best in the East, actually. Um, we tried even a morphine pump. I have an <coughs> intrathecal pump inside me that puts, sends morphine up to my brain through a delivery system and it releases my own endorphins into um, trying to control the pain. But of course, there's breakthrough pain in my life every day, and, and I don't like to take medicine during the day because I don't want to be snowed under. I like to be as, an, as alert as I can be. I have four grandchildren I like to play with, so I like to be wide awake for that. You know, they're my life at this point. And I hope to be around for a few years to have a few more years to play with them. But it's getting to the point now I don't know what to do at this point. And, and I appeal to you from the bottom of my heart to please reconsider this and to, to look at the scientific facts on it. Listen closely to the people. And don't believe everything you first hear. And I thank you very much for your time. Any questions? Like to ask me? Questions? Also tried amino acids. They only work for a little while. Maybe put four or five pounds on me, and I'll hold that for a year, but then that drops too. So it's hit or miss with that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. Holly Whitaker.
to sit down, but I can probably explain myself better standing up. My name is Holly Whitaker. Uh, this is a writ my written testimony in support of HB 573. Um, I grew up in Hudson, New Hampshire, and I'm 55 years old. My hobbies are playing guitar, growing flowers, crocheting hats, and spending time with my dog, Rocky. This is Rocky. He helps me, gets the mail, laundry, and the phone, and a lot of other things he does. Um, we live in Hennepin, New Hampshire, and I am here in support of this bill, which will help me live a full and normal life. Over the years, my health has deteriorated and the list of my ailments grown longer and my pain has become more severe. First, I want to try to quickly go over my conditions. Um, osteoporosis, degeneration of the lumbar sacral and thoracic intervertebral discs, mangioma of T7 vertebrae, Diphragmatic hernia, tron meniscus, that's me cat, chondromalacia patella, that's some of the knee, <coughs> multiple thyroid nodules, fibromyalgia, severe muscle pains, degenerative joint disease of the knee, diverticulitis, cysts in both kidneys, scoliosis, and anxiety. Both my shoulders have been operated on and the left rotator cuff needs repair again. The pain from the fibromyalgia and the osteoarthritis are enough, but all these other conditions on top of that really make it hard to live and function without marijuana. I have pain in my hands, pain in my feet, my back, my neck, head, knees, everywhere. I get up most of it's in my arms. I get four hours of sleep a night unless I smoke marijuana because of the pain. If I use marijuana, I can go to bed earlier and stay asleep longer. Without it, I won't fall asleep till two o'clock and I'll have to get up by six because of my hip and shoulder pain. I have an overall throbbing, burning, and numbness in my arms. It is hard to live with all these problems. But smoking marijuana helps with the pain and sleep and reduces stress. It has even helped my severe stomach cramps when I have a diverticulitis attack. I'm going to leave that for last because I added, this was supposed to be like, like my closing statement. A little, a few comments on other stuff. I am, I'm going to try to put, I am, I am loving proof that marijuana works. I am not a drug deal or addict. I am the clinical study. And I have stood the test of time. I am not an alcoholic or a criminal, nor do I have a criminal record. If marijuana is regulated, it cannot be abused, as it will be prescribed and rationed just like prescription drugs. Obama said there is no money for federal prosecutors to prosecute. They will have to let the criminals go, he said. Prosecution costs money. It costs $35,000 to house a criminal for a year in the state of New Hampshire. It is not fair to prosecute the people that are trying to help themselves. As marijuana gets regulated, it becomes more pure. And marinol has some of the chemical ingredients, not all. So it cannot be compared, as these missing ingredients do matter. There is no pill to compare it with, only derivatives such as opium. Like I said, prosecution costs money. Federal, law, federal laws will change soon. There is no money to prosecute. With this bill, there will be alternative treatment centers in place where people can go to smoke and get their marijuana to take home. It will be pure. 
refined. It is up to the parents to control the children to assume that the teenagers will run rampant smoking is like saying they're all going to get drunk or pop pills until they are 18. <coughs> it is the parents who are responsible to make sure the kids don't abuse drugs. George Washington grew and smoked marijuana. If marijuana is rationed, it is tested for cannabinoid content. If not, not it, uh, it is up to the parents to keep the marijuana in a safe place, like medicine and alcohol. It has nothing to do with this bill. Federal law is changing as we speak. There's no money left, Obama said. He wasn't going after the smokers. How can you tell that the cardholder gave anyone a joint? A search warrant costs money. Police time costs money. Um, let me see. My last statement is, therefore, I hope you support this historic bill, not only for me, but for all the people who suffer like me. I don't want to feel like a criminal in my own house when I am minding my own business, crocheting mats at night by myself in the chair with Rocky sleeping on the couch waiting for me to go to bed. Please, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker, Senator, Mr. Chairman, Representatives, <coughs> Honorable Committee, please pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Governor Chaffin. members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Deva Chafee, and I'm the executive director of the New Hampshire Civil Liberties Union. I guess what I just want to start out by saying is uh, how impressed I am uh, with the persistence of this committee, um, and not just over these over three, oh, close to four hours now that you've been considering this issue before the committee today with such careful deliberation, but also in the previous years. For not, you know, since I've heard since 2009, have had many of you been considering this issue, and to me, your persistence demonstrates that you clearly have a, a, a real understanding of the seriousness of the issue when we're talking about human suffering and individuals' qualities of life. And, and I just want to say how I uh, commend the committee for their work on this, and and also how confident um, I think that the committee should be in. The, sort of the culmination of the work over a number of years that have been incorporated into the amendment that was offered today. I think that this amendment is not simply the product of, uh, a, 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 of even a, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, uh, but all the work that so many of you have put in over a number of years. It is a strong bill, it is a tight bill, um, and it is much more sophisticated than bills that have been passed in other states. And I think that those have, who have participated in this process should be very proud of that product and that you all should be very confident going forward. I realize that you know there, there is still process to be done um, throughout this year, but you, ha you are in a very good starting place. Clearly the homework has been done. Um, and I just, I, I want to say if there's one thing to take away from the testimony that we've heard today, people who have come back year after year, um, is that the time to act is now. This is the year. Um, and this is the time. And there will always be individuals that are going to oppose this bill. I mean, they may give a number of reasons. They may sometimes say flat out, we're, we're, we're anti-medical marijuana. Uh, but they may also simply uh, nitpick the bill to death. They may try to kill the bill with a thousand cuts. They may ask you to go find the broomstick of the wicked witch of the West 
um, in order to save this bill. And I just want to want to urge you not to allow the naysayers to divert you from the ultimate objective. If you agree, like the vast majority of New Hampshire citizens, that indeed we should have uh, a provision for medical marijuana, I urge you not to allow the naysayers to divert you from that objective. Um, and so that is that is the main main point that I just wanted to focus on today. Um, you know, clearly, uh, New Hampshire has a little catching up to do. There are already 18 states that have medical marijuana, uh, including all the rest of the states in New England. Um, with all due respect to the lieutenant, it's very hard to, to see how New Hampshire could possibly become a mecca for marijuana use when all of the surrounding states already have medical marijuana laws in place. Um, and, and for the most part, these laws are working well. Um, and they are working with minimal federal intervention. And the reason why that is, is you know, marijuana is largely, it's largely a state issue. So state laws, New Hampshire has its own laws, states have their own laws regulating marijuana, and yes, there are federal laws that are separate laws. But the bottom line is that regardless of who is, uh, who is president or who is the attorney general, 99% of marijuana arrests are done at the state level. So regardless of who is in power, regardless of what the federal policy is, really this is mostly a state issue. Um, and where we have seen the federal government getting involved, it's states that were not uh, as fortunate as New Hampshire has been to have such a thoughtful legislature that has put together such a tight regulatory frame, but states where there were far fewer regulations, where you know, these problems, like certain problems uh, have arisen. Um, and in other states where there are tighter regulatory frames, like New Mexico, Rhode Island, Maine, uh, you just haven't seen those problems. I just um, really quickly want to um, uh, urge you in my in very brief one-page written testimony, I've given a little bit of information, um, including many of the uh, medical associations and organizations that support access for medicinal purposes, and I bring this up because there was some discussion about what the opinion of medical community was. I just wanted to highlight that there are a number of medical organizations that support the use of medical uh, medical marijuana, and I've listed those there. You know, the American Public Health Association, the Arthritis Research Campaign, the Lymphoma Foundation of America, the American Nurses Association, and a number of others that are listed there. Um, and I guess I will just end by, you know, we've seen in the testimony today that there are a number of people here in this state, here in New Hampshire, for whom medical marijuana could provide some relief, who can't find that relief in other treatments. And so, you know, I urge you to, you know, they, they are, they have, um, they are counting on you. Um, and I just, I urge you, not only should you be the committee to report uh, the bill as amended uh, ought to pass out of committee, but I also urge each of you uh, to make a priority of this bill this year. Um, because again, as I said, I, I really do believe that the time is now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Last uh, Angela Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for taking the time to hear me. I'm going to talk as soon as possible. Um, my name is Angela Harris, and I'm a resident of Manchester. Um, I've been a registered nurse for 14 years, and for the last nine of those years, I've been a hospice nurse. As I'm sure most of you are aware, the philosophy of hospice is to provide comfort, dignity, and improved quality of life for those with terminal illnesses. A large component of that objective is symptom management. For if the symptom management of a disease, if the symptoms of a disease aren't managed, patients are deprived of the opportunity to spend their final days enjoying the company of their loved ones and doing th those things that they never like, meaning. Through the course of my career, I've cared for a number of patients that have used cannabis medicinally, albeit illegally, because their prescribed pharmaceuticals, including those like Marinol, were not sufficiently effective. One particular case I remember is of a man, I'll call him Pete. He was an older gentleman. He had just reached retirement age when he developed pancreatic cancer. His world was turned upside down, and this previously independent man found himself having to rely on his children and his friends to help him through his day. 
I met with him at his home to explain hospice care to him and to help him to determine which services would best suit his needs. Sitting in his modest, modest living room on one of the hottest days of the summer, he informed me that not only was his, was his cancer causing him ab abdominal pain, but he had no appetite and had lost more than 40 pounds over the previous year. He was often nauseated and vomited almost daily. In addition to that, he had an almost near constant burning sensation in his hands and feet as a result of his chemotherapy treatments. Um, he was frustrated and anxious because, as he said, his medications weren't worth squat. I asked him at that time if he had any other treatments that he used to help alleviate his symptoms, and he very sheepishly said yes, but I don't want to say. After reassuring him that I was not there to judge him or to condemn, he admitted to me that his daughter had purchased cannabis for him after they had both researched the medicinal benefits. He was desperate to find relief, although he'd never used marijuana before, and he was unsure of what to expect. He reported to me that using cannabis a couple of times per day had helped his pain, appetite, and the burning sensations, and it even helped him be less anxious and fearful about his prognosis. He was able to eat meals with his family without having to leave for the bathroom and could spend time playing with the grand grandchildren that he would probably leave behind by Christmas. His biggest concern was for his daughter. He was worried that she would be caught purchasing his medications. He worried about her future and the future of his grandchildren should she be arrested and convicted for the simple act of trying to make her father's last days more comfortable. I developed a bond with Pete during the last few hours, uh, during the few hours we spent together, and although I wasn't his regular nurse, I found myself checking in on him from time to time. He was indeed gone by Christmas, but over the three or four months from the time I met him, he was able to enjoy a quality of life that I believe he would not have had had he not used cannabis. And Pete's story is just one example of the number of patients that I've worked with that use cannabis to alleviate their symptoms, uh, alleviate. Um, like Pete, many have never used it before, and nearly all were reluctant to try it, mainly because of the potential legal ramifications for themselves or their loved ones. But every one of them had positive results when using it, whether they took it for pain, nausea, vomiting, anxiety, uh, insomnia, <coughs> anorexia, which is loss of appetite, cachexia, which is a wasting syndrome, and some of them for even for seizures. I know I'm not alone in my experience, and every hospice worker that I've talked to personally, regardless of their discipline, physician, nurse, social worker, and chaplain, have been in favor of the legalization of medical marijuana because it is a safe and effective remedy and from some patients with chronic, and I'll include chronic illnesses as well, and terminal illness, it's their only option to have the quality of life that they deserve. And I strongly encourage you to support this bill. Thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Close the public hearing on House Bill 573. Let's take about a five minute break to the subcommittee uh, representative.